it in. Hey, check it out. Hey, it's going down. Hey, mash it up. Hey, mash it up. Mash it up. Mash it up. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. You are now flying. Where my captain at? Southwest. Uh. Wake up, moon outside. It's a party. Hop up, dedication. It's a party. The K N D destruction. It's a party. Too live, too lit. Move with the body. Bible with the pins in a black bag. Dance, 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 dance real fast. Zanavan book, yeah, I got that. Hold up, that's an Israelite starter pack. Pass over, dance with a stepping hand. Beast day show for a contraband. Dancing like I'm trying to see the homeland. Pentecost first fruits to the big man. Uh, nobody party like an Israelite. Uh, fist in the air like it's time to fight. North the kingdom trying to party with the jewel dice. Bop, 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 my bitch of ice. We rolling like Wakanda in the king time. Meanwhile, he told us we can party in the meantime. All the little beats probably start around your bedtime. Dancing in the field like a band when it's halftime. Uh, you ain't got no wine here, have mine. Don't talk about your sorrow, this a bad time. Look, I'm just trying to tell you that it's hard time. For us to battle to this beat like it's drum line. Wake up, move. Not side, it's a party. Pop up, dedication, it's a party. It can't not destruction, it's a party. Too live, too lit, move with the body. Wake up, moon outside, it's a party. Pop up, dedication, it's a party. It can't not destruction, it's a party. Too live, too lit, move with the body. Dance, Lord, time, just move up your body. Don't get loose and groove on the body. Bruce, wine, I'm a party. If you're not turn up, then you are granddaddy. We let, we let, we living in the truth. We full up at the style and we dripping with the juice. I mean, where the most I choose, let me have some. Me dance and sweat till me slipping in me boots. Yeah, party and then a party. We have fun and a dancing where we are dancing till we see the sun. Party where we are party and have fun. Now we not gonna left the party till it done. Get it in, hey, check it out, hey. Get it in, hey, check it out, hey. It's going down, hey. Mash it up, hey. Mash it up, mash it up, mash it up. Get it in, hey. Check it out, hey. Get it in, hey. Check it out, hey. It's going down, hey. Mash it up, mash it up, mash it up, mash it up. Wake up, moon outside, it's a party. Hop up, dedication, it's a party. The K nut destruction, it's a party. Too live, too lit, move with the body. Wake up, moon outside, it's a party. Hop up, dedication, it's a party. The K nut destruction, it's a party. Too live, too lit, move with the body. school program. This is not high school. Girl vibes in the area. Well, well, man a fighter from the start. I mean, no carry grudging on the heart. Hatred make you turn from your people. Wise up, I feel be smart. DJ, turn up the lights from the start. Start. 
Ring tune, do it up, celebrate class. We no carry God in on the arm. Mm. We no carry God in on the arm. I'm not really smiling at me face, me realize. Try give me this head for me, see they might be spiritualized. It's still like enduring at this trouble when the pressure rise. Man, I feel so lean at the giddy and be stay alive. No sweat and tears, endure self-sacrifice. Still not give up, can make my rest for price. Now try give me strength for your back of my enemy. Them full of jealousy. My show to the thing we not fake, we not counterfeit. I know for them what they mean, know them full of shit. Be perfect, Israel never quit. After be heard in the fire, so me tell you this. My show to the thing we not fake, we not counterfeit. I know for them what they mean, know them full of shit. Be perfect, Israel never quit. After be heard in the fire, so me tell you this. Turn up the lights from the start. Ring tune, pull it up, celebrate cause. We no carry God in on the arm. Mm. We no carry God in on the arm. DJ, turn up the lights from the start. Ring tune, pull it up, celebrate us. We no carry God in on the arm. Mm. We no carry God in on the arm. That time again, yeah, de la hora, you know, power hour, uh, Bol pole atención, class is in session, tuning for an hour, maybe more, that's a blessing, learn from the captains and the leadership, flee from religion, cause them churches never teaching shit, everything you learn for your benefit, line upon line is a requisite, never take a deficit, yeah, that mean you take a loss if you stray from the way, you get that understanding if you study every day, apply what you learn, and bless when you pray, it's one interpretation, man, it's saying what it's saying, ya venía el tiempo, entra para el templo, aprende el maestro con talento, la Biblia es el centro, usando a Israel como instrumento, no te pierdas en doctrina como viento, estudia y ora y aplica, tiempo para Dios, ven, hace una cita, escritura dinamita, morenos y hispanos, israelita, oye como explica, Israel unido en Cristo para la vida, nunca se divida, tune in, it's the power hour, learn your family history, don't be a coward, yeah, tune in, it's the power hour, I said learn your family history, don't be a coward. Yeah, it's me and the world, it's the power I am, the only way I am, too many curious things, you know what I mean, it's the power I am, the only way I am, you know what I mean, it's the Shalom, shalom. Welcome to the Power Hour Plus edition. I am Captain Yashua. Shalom, most high in Christ. Bless Captain Amariah. And uh, Soldier Tobias. And Soldier Tobias. You've been on the show before, right, Soldier? No, sir. First time. No. Yes, sir. Oh, all right. So I was going to clown you right now for not talking, but. So was I. Yeah. But welcome. Let's We welcome Soldier Tobias from the tribe of Judah to the show. Thank you, sir. Just we we. We, we're all about equal representation here in the That's Power right. Hour Plus. That's right. Equal representation. I want to show love to all our brothers. Um, so, uh, hey, in keeping with making sure that uh, we start off with a scripture, and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for those out Bruh. there. Mm -hmm. uh, can you read John 8.32? <laughs> Where's he going with this? This is the book of John, chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And in the process of bringing out that truth, oftentimes in giving the sense, we got to be able to go ahead and bring this Bible to life for people. And that's done with uh, taking all the meat off the bone in verses, uh, sometimes that's done making sure that you bring a plethora of precepts to support the position of the most high. Right. So, like, for example, John 316, you want to really dissect that thing? Mm -hmm. You got boom, 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 boom. You just several scriptures that you'll go to for that. Right. Exactly. Right. And then in other cases, when you're going into historical context, when you're trying to bring things out for people, you're going to have stretches of the show where you're going to need to be able to, like, 
go over books and go over different things. You know, but there's some people out there for some reason they got an issue with that. There was a hater. Yeah, bro. What? Yeah, that's right. You've had like some things where like you haven't been able to be on yeah, the show yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So there was a comment. Uh, I think when we did, actually, you were here for that show, and then mm-hmm. I think you were you were like uh, caught up in some stuff after that. When we went over the uh, Harvest of Empire, the first time we were watching the thing. Yeah. Do comment on the thing, bro. Forty five minutes before scripture came out. Oh gosh. And I was like, all this great information out there. And he talking about 45 minutes for scripture. So came that means out. that he was intently watching for 45 minutes uh, to uh, wait for uh, a, a scripture? I don't know. Or he f- was fast. I mean. I don't know. That's ridiculous. Bro. Stop. Stop. And then, and then, like I said, I, and listen, so for me, right, I'm being real facetious about it at this point because it's yeah, been right. like a month and I'm still maybe more and I'm still. <laughs> So I said, I'm not going to let that happen again. I said, I'm going to read a scripture at the beginning of every show. Boom. I may even pick a random one. So far, I've been sp- sticking with John 8 for two weeks in a row. I said, but I may oh, read a random right. one. It's good. Just so people could shuff up. So when Bishop oh, bring out a right. class where he going over all this type of stuff with books and they go like an hour, 40 minutes without a scripture, right? He don't got a problem. Bro. Deacon Ithan's show, going into all that history, right? Nobody right. got nothing to say. If you, you, know, you know what it was, though, right? I'm gonna tell you exactly why. Wait, I I think I know why. Because you look less like the ones that were brought on slave ships, and look yes. more like the ones that brought people. That on is slave correct. Ships. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Because <laughs> there was yet another comment on a video. I can't remember which one. And someone said of, about the Phoenix game. Damn. So it looks like Issachar is always teaching. Which, which we're going to talk about Issachar today, all right? We're going to bring out some good oh, information boy. on Issachar, all right? Um, but not everybody's Issachar. But I'm going to show you why you think everybody's Issachar in the United States. Because uh, they actually happen to be uh, recorded the largest so-called Latino group in the United States, right? I think it's upwards of like 40 million yeah. Mexicans here compared yeah. compared to all the other Northern Kingdom races uh, that are here, uh, the D- Northern Kingdom tribes. Um, but he was like, yeah, why are all the Mexicans always teaching? Judah needs to teach more. That's out of order. Oh, gosh. I said, my goodness. I said, boy. What is this, 1991? No, no you know what it is? It's people asking for the day of the Lord and they ain't ready. That's what it is. Yeah, for sure. And they hey, ain't look, ready. Someone, someone saying... Where's the scripture or it's been 45 minutes without scripture is ignorant as hell because us being able to go to outside sources like books and videos to to validate the Bible even more, even even though the Bible stands alone. I'm not saying that anything's greater than the Bible, but I'm saying is the fact that the most I give us these tools to be able to go into them and, and show who we That's are. Point. That should increase your faith instead of just being a hater. It's ridiculous, man. Yeah, it, it really is. So, like I said, because people have been watching the show and I keep talking about it, I'm being facetious about it. I, I definitely am. Right? Um, you know, I, at first it was anger, and then now it's just funny to me. So I'm being funny with it too. All right. Um, we're going to bring up our uh, inventor. Did you bring up? Uh, you don't even remember from last week, producer, do you, right? I Give said, me bring one up, second. Give me wait, one second. Same one from last week. The 11 groundbreaking inventions, and we're going to go to number two. But don't put it on the screen yet, all right? I want to do some link sharing here that I didn't get to do because we were kind of – I haven't freaking seen you, so we were, like, chopping it up. Yeah, I know. You're just too busy for me. Wow, it's me now. It's my fault. It's my fault. It is. It is. So while he's sharing that, all right, I'll, I'll do some quick uh, housekeeping, all right? Call the number is 516-531-9797. 516-531-9797. Questions and comments pertain to the topic, feel free to call. We like to keep it open and loose. and uh, So feel free to, to call with your thoughts. We would love to hear them. Um, also, for more truth, visit IsraelUnite.org. That is www.IsraelUnite.org. I know that a lot of people don't really take advantage of that too much because we got radio shows and, I mean, Clubhouse and a gazillion of one YouTube videos and things like that. But there's a reason why we have that website on our flyers and cards, because that's the place where people can go when they first come into this walk and get the basics to be built up of who they are and what's required of them of the Lord. Give me John 8, verse 32 again. That was good. Let's bring it out again. The book of St. John, chapter 8, verse 32. 
and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Read on. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? It says we are never in bondage to any man, but are we in bondage today? Yes. Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, you are in bondage. So it's knowing that truth that's going to set you free and knowing who you are. And it's not just precept upon precept because the average person can't pick up the Bible and understand who they are according to the scriptures. So we need to go to these outside sources to be able to tie in these curses to our people to give it the sense. See? It started with anger with you, and now you're being facetious, and now it's, and now I'm angry about it. Well, because you missed the whole anger part, right? <laughs> Bro, it's ridiculous, man. Yep, yep, yeah. That thing vexed the hell out of me. I said, my gosh, with everything that's coming out on this show, especially that that particular one, you can sit there and talk about that. Uh, listen, a house divided can't stand, man, and all those little schisms, because that's what the Bible calls them, little schisms. That thing is just delaying the inevitable arrival of our king, all right? You're just messing around. That's what it is, man. I'm telling you. It's it's ridiculous. Yep. Haters going to hate. Haters going to hate. They hate us because they ain't us. It's ridiculous, bro. You got you got people out there that say that that only Afro-Latinos, only Afro-Americans can be saved. Then you got the flip side where you got Northern Kingdom saying that all – um, Southern Kingdom is all Hamites and that only Latinos can be saved. So this, I mean, it's just ridiculous, bro. It's crazy. That's why we have these scriptures and, and all. The, listen, when I came into this, when the brother told me I was Israel, he said, do you know that, that you're in the Bible? And I said, well, no, because it's full of white people. Because how can I look into something on my own and see it? That's why when you read Acts, it said, well, how can I understand it unless some man should guide me? So we, we have, and then you go to our people and tell them, oh, you were on slave ships. And there's no history recorded of that other than the hidden history that we go to to show them, no, yes, look, Mexicans are in the Bible because these things happen to your people. And you got haters like that, bro. Come on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're going to jump into the show. I got a lot to cover. I don't know if I'll be able to go over all of it, right? We're going to watch uh, another segment of the documentary and talk about that. And then, you know, I say, like, I'm going to let it play, but then stuff is said and we got to comment, so we got to stop it. So yeah, right. it's like it's like a 15-minute clip we're going to watch today, but it's going to take longer than 15 minutes. Um, That's actually a pretty long clip, bro. Yeah, I got minutes. pages from the book. Well, no, we're going to skip some, so it's less because there's somewhere there, like, the guy's talking about how he's so proud to serve this country. Whatever. What's the uh, what's the title? Uh, Wait, what is the title? I came up with it, too. <laughs> uh, Mexicans didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. Is that like a play on uh, we didn't land on, on Plymouth Rock? Plymouth Rock landed on us. Uh, I guess, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's the uh, Northern Kingdom version of it. That's the Northern Kingdom version okay. of it. That's what's up. Um, and uh, I say us because it's Israel, right? Yeah, right. I'm yeah, not. Absolutely. I'm not from the tribe of Issachar. I don't know how many times we got to say that. I'm not Issachar. Put the camera on Captain Amari. Put the camera on Captain. Amari. He's not Issachar. All right. <laughs> He's actually from the tribe of Levi. Bring it out. I am from the tribe of Ephraim, all right? I'm from what the tribe of Ephraim. What about Tobias? Huh? Tobias is Judah. Judah. Right? Judah. Judah. His father looks like Shaft. That's right. But to some brothers, he he he's not acceptable. They'll just go by that, right. that he shouldn't be there. Right. Looking like Shaft. My nose is more Judah than his nose. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Hey, you know what? And I say that because we have stereotypes. We have stereotypes in our head. And we got to get that out of our head. You got to stop thinking of Northern Kingdom as the prototypical, you know, Juan or Carlos. Rice right? and beans. Rice and, and beans. Speaky Spanish. Right? Elote. And you got to stop thinking of uh, of Judah as just looking like Shaft. You know, right, like, yeah. I mean, we, we, we are a speckled bird. We look like all nations because we were scattered into the earth like all nations. And when you understand that history, then you're less confused about what the scriptures bring out about our appearances. And there it is. Yeah. You're less confused. You're, there's no more confusion. All right. Because you right. let the scriptures speak for themselves. The spirit bears witness with our spirit. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I remember, I, we speak about it often, uh, times uh, when we talk about this topic on the show, the dude in Bronx camp looked straight up Japanese, bro. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, Ephraim. Yep. And he was Ephraim, bro. Like, but you would look at him and just be like, no, man, something wrong. Yep. You know? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> he he did. And he was Ephraim, bro. No, man, he looks he <laughs> looks Asian, but right. he's smoking a menthol yeah, and, man. and has yeah. a more yeah. beverage in his hand. I don't know. He, hey, let me tell you, you know that your 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 faith and your place in this walk has taken a, a, a step forward when you can just have intense love for Israel and you and you're not so concerned about the tribes as much. There it is. An appearance of who is and who isn't, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, with all the work we got to do and with all the, you know, people wonder, oh, "Damn, why is IUIC prospering?" And in their minds, because right, like Bishop Yalosabo often says, the Negro mind, and when I say the Negro mind, that includes Hispanics, natives, right? The Negro mind was is a product of what the white man, what our oppressors have done to us. Mm -hmm. And they've done such an amazing job. They've done such an amazing job at it that they got some of our brothers and sisters when this great truth, when more things that are shown unto us that men understand is being brought out and they worried about a complexion. They're worried about representation. Yet you're still caught up in all your wokeness in the way Esau wants you to think and operate. What the hell is this? Ridiculous, ridiculous. Anyway, let's look at our invention this week. This is a short one. This will be a short one. We're going to go to number two, okay? So last week we spoke about the color TV being Northern Kingdom, right? Neonatal artificial bubble. Born in Peru, Claudio Castillon Levano invented the neonatal artificial bubble designed to improve the intensive medical care of high-risk newborns. So you know how you see in movies or some of our brothers and sisters have had like uh, babies that maybe have been premature or have to go to intensive care Mm -hmm. and they put them in this little enclosure and stuff. Mm -hmm. That was not a white man that made that. That was uh, this brother, Claudio Castillon Levano. So you mean to tell me that the white man lied about that? Yes. What? From from what? Peru, which is the tribe of Asher, which is the tribe of Asher. The tribe of Asher invented the neonatal artificial bubble. All oh, praises to the Most High. Look at that life-saving technology that was created by one of uh, our brothers, one of our brothers. So, uh, gosh, where do I start? I don't know where I want. I don't know if I want to start with the book. I'm gonna start a little bit with the book. I'm gonna start a little bit with the book. Wait, hold on. I have some links too. I gotta put my links up that I posted because I like to have them up here. What links? Oh, you guys were talking here. Gosh, listen, man. You were. I. You know what? You did a great job today in being ready on time. And I've become complacent thinking that you're still on CPT time, and and, and that's not been the case. Hey, you see, hey, you see how he flipped it and reversed it on you like that, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> oh, man. I'll flip it and reverse it. And scan that skip for them, yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go to the book, Harvest of Empire. All right. Can you? Because I didn't send you a picture to cover. I'm sorry. So I'm holding up a picture of it. All right. Um, so the documentary we've been screening on the show is called Harvest of Empire, and it's based off of this book. Now, the, bo- the documentary only covers a few countries. Uh, depending on how good all the information is, um, I want to go through this whole book on a series of shows, right? So we dealt with uh, Guatemala, which, interestingly enough, is not a separate chapter in this book. Uh, but we have some separate chapters here. Um, there's uh, Puerto Rico we got to talk about in there. Um, but I, right, what I'm doing right now is I'm going along with the documentary. And uh, the documentary started this way. So they did Guatemala first as a highlight. They uh, Now today we're going to discuss uh, Mexico. And then uh, next week, uh, Laws Will Life Last, we're going to talk about Cuba. Right. So we have Cuba. Um, Dominicans are in the book, not in the documentary. Uh, Central Americans, I think some of it is in the documentary. And then uh, we have Colombians and Panamanians. Panamanians sent to technically Central America, too. Um and uh, we're going to break all that down if it be the Lord's will, if it be the Lord's will. Uh, and then they got some other stuff here that I don't know I'll go into. But he talks about Puerto Rico quite a bit because the author, I believe, is Puerto Rican. So um, but we'll talk about all that. So I'm going to open up with a page from here in the uh, Mexican section. All right, That's what they call it. Uh, so Mexicans, pioneers of a different type. The whole race of Mexicans here is becoming a useless commodity, becoming cheap, dog cheap, 
11 Mexicans, it is stated, have been found along the Nueces in a hung-up condition. That's the Galveston Weekly News. Like, this was reported in the news. This wasn't even, like, somebody's, like, yeah, they right. allowed this stuff. And it's, it's like, sh- amazing to me because uh, nowadays, right, everybody's so PC, meaning, like, politically correct on what's presented and how it's presented. Like, something like this today would, would never get printed, probably, right? But to let you know, it's all part of the game that they play with us, right? So um, we're going to jump around to some of these pages. So the Mexican diaspora is at the core of our country's Latino heritage. Not only are two of every three Latinos in the United States of Mexican origin, but only Mexicans can claim to be both early settlers on U.S. soil and the largest group of new arrivals. So he says two out of three of Latinos in the United States, right, are, um, so two-thirds basically, are uh mexican so this is what like i was saying earlier like everybody looks at it and like everybody assumes northern kingdom and they say mexican right i mean i see it all the time everybody's like people who don't know me they're like oh yeah that's that mexican brother they're like no i'm puerto rican they're like what part of mexico is that yeah, yeah. exactly that's exactly <laughs> what happens i'm puerto rican what part of mexico is that <laughs> um and it has a lot to do because like he calls it here it was a diaspora and, and, and that, by and large, that's basically what we're going over. And, you know, that's indicative of the Israelites historically. Mm-hmm. We've always been in some form of diaspora from Adam. Yep. From Adam. Because we, Adam, was kicked out of where we were meant to dwell in, in Eden and not allowed to return. I spoke of that when I saw it Monday, and I said it, it, he, he actually had to hide it from us and put an angel to guard it. To make sure that we weren't rebellious and try to go back, right? right. So we've our history is all about diaspora. To this day, we're not where we need to be, and the Bible tells you that. Yet another little thing to let you know that the people that are over there in what that's not even the original lines of what was uh, Israel under um, once Joshua took over Canaan and so on from there. Uh, it's not even the original lines of that. And when we had the rulership, when we had kings in Israel. Um, and they claim that to be Israel and they claim to have a home now. That's not biblical. No, not at all. Because because the Bible says whether they believe in, in, in Christ having been the Messiah or not, right? Because you want to get into semantics of their religion. They don't believe in Jesus Christ, right? Um, whether they believe that or not, it still shows because the Bible prophesied that there would be a Messiah that would bring us back to the land. Yeah, right. So unless they're saying Trump and... You know yeah. the uh, the Balfour decree and all that stuff like that is well, uh well and plus you know it's not correct too because it's be it's gonna be the Messiah that brings us back to the land right and then the the borders is gonna go back to where it was always meant to be right this is the border ready <laughs> right oh, it was meant oh, it was meant to be the whole earth the whole planet Earth the whole Earth not not some little sliver that they know. As as the landmass of Israel, right. that's full of that, the Sodom that, agenda that, and everything that, else. That 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 has uh uh one of the most gayest cities Bro. in the world in Bro. Tel Aviv. Bro, Tel Aviv is one of the most homosexual cities. Having having a good old time. Hey, since since we're talking about so called Mexicans, right? Who's a tribe of Issachar? Real quick, growing up, like we always lived around Issachar, and I I would always beef with them, right? Always, I always had a thing that like like I I didn't like Issachar growing up, right? Show you, going back to what you said about once you can stop seeing tribes and just see Israel as a people and have love for your people. The brother that taught me I was Israel is Issachar. Mm-hmm. I came in, it was four other Issacharites, and now I'm married to a so-called Mexican. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how much of a mastermind. <laughs> Most I had to humble you oh, on absolutely, that. Bro. He had to humble that spirit that was mm-hmm. cultivated in you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I say cultivated because the difference is in Esau, he's not upright. His spirit was made this way to be in variance and division to us, right? right. Uh, but the hate that our people have for each other, that's unnatural. And that's why the Most High gets so angry about that thing. That's yeah. not a natural thing. That's the spirit of Cain. Mm-hmm. And while we're related to Esau, all right, we're not the same people. The Most High pulled a nation out of that, right? So there's a difference there. The hatred that we have for, for, for each other is not a a natural hatred. It is a cultivated hatred. It is a hatred that was sat down amongst all the nations like you read in Psalm 83, yeah, right. and they cultivated that thing because we go over that a lot on this show. For the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about it today, 
But Psalms 83, then I usually go to Psalms 2 mm-hmm. to show you about the casting the bands asunder. And then to Zechariah 11. And then Zechariah 11, 14. Yeah, and they tell you that the bands that they're speaking about are the bands of brotherhood. So that was part of their crafty counsel to cultivate a spirit of hate between us. Hate. That's why when Christ was on the scene, people get hella confused that he was talking about love all people. He was trying to bring the love back that we should naturally have for each other. That's why he said that this is a new law that I give you to yes. love each other like you love yes. yourself. Yes, and that's why yeah. Paul talks about many of our people, our brothers and sisters, not having natural affection. Yeah. Because our natural affection should be to love each other, to, to, to die for each other. Just like Christ was willing to die for us. That comes naturally. That comes naturally. But um, what what's not natural is this environment, this cultivation of hate that, that our enemies have put on us. And they continue to do it. And uh, their devices, right, they're able to, to kind of circumvent um, certain things that the Bible says with their psychology, right? Because they and 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 their science and one of the ways they do that is because they make this less important. Mm -hmm. They make this less of the focal point. Right. If you notice, there's an evolution in our captivity away from this by them, where for a period of time they used it as the primary weapon against us. But now since we can read and the prophets are still here and uh, where, you know, your eyes are seeing your teachers. They're changing the game where they're trying to actually move away from religion. Yeah, like they 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 push this thing where they like to convince our people that man created God versus the, the other way around. And then when our people buy into that because they see all the all the different wonders, like how the Bible calls it, of his technology, of his warfare, and things like that, and it's like, okay, well then, yes, this man is the pinnacle of perfection, and there is no God. So that's why people stray from or stray away from that thing completely. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, yeah. So we have a caller, right? And I don't I believe it's his first time joining to the radio show, but he was saying that how do we not know that just like how God commanded us or commanded uh the Israelites when they left Egypt to destroy the Canaanites and the Philistines and all the Hemetic nations, how do we not know that God uh, did the same thing on this side of the earth, but now he turned it on us. And I told him, hey, we do know, we we can read it in the Bible that these things would happen to us. He's still on the line. I don't know if you want to bring him on. And that's um, going to take us away from the topic a little bit. I mean, you gave him the answer. Um, oh, that's going to take me way, way away from where, where we're trying to be. Hey, uh, give him the email. Yeah, yeah, that that's something like he could email and then, you know, maybe maybe one of the officers or something can dialogue with him about that. But we appreciate the call and we appreciate you tuning in. I just don't I just don't want to turn this into a different type of show. Yeah, like like how the officer said, because that may be your first time tuning in. It's not something that we can give you in just 30 seconds real quick, point blank, simple. It's going to be precept upon precept, bringing in history. And like how the captain said, it's going to take us way far off topic. So. Um, the brother's going to give you an email and some contact information. If you're sincere, then just send send your question, and then we'll have a dialogue then. Right. All right. praises. All praises. Uh, so let's get back uh, to here. So it says, not only are two of every three Latinos in the United States of Mexican origin, but only Mexicans can claim to be both early settlers on U.S. soil and the largest group of new arrivals, right? <laughs> And we're going to explore that dynamic. That right there is the crux of the show as we go through some history and stuff is – how could they have been the uh the er, one of the early settlers, right? To claim to be the early settlers in the US because mm-hmm. we know that through the history of the apocrypha, which we'll read out in Second Ezra 13 because we know we get some new people uh uh tuning in. And it's right? always good. Right, it's <laughs> always good. It's always good, right? So he says they're part of the early settlers, right? Acknowledging that what? They were not indigenous to here, right? And taking it further, taking it further um, neither was the so-called Native Americans because I saw a Facebook post the other day. One of the chiefs was talking about, he was talking against the Bible, basically saying that they're not the Israelites because their history is longer than that. That's an ego thing. That's a pride thing. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Because because what, what you're presuming is you're taking the Bible in the way it was fed to you by the white man and you're decreasing it, thinking that it predates it. The Bible starts with the book of Genesis. Genesis means the beginning. Nobody predated the beginning. Right. 
No, except the Most High. Yeah, right. Except the Most High. The Most High predated the beginning. So and so that's like an ego thing to say. No, our our history is older than that. Well, your fairy tales might be older than that. And getting into the concept of time, right? I just, I if you think about it, you want to really get into it. I just dropped a banger. I said the only thing that was before the beginning was God. Yeah, right. So he said, "Well, no, you're wrong because our history predates the Bible because we were there when." When the great tortoise climbed out of the sea with the earth on his right, back. Right, right. That type of nonsense. Bruh. That type of nonsense. <laughs> yet, yet, in some of their origin stories, they have very similar accounts mm -hmm. to what it says uh, in the history of Exodus and Moses parting the Red Sea or whatever. They just call it different names. That goes into the reprobateness. That's part of the curses. It goes to show you, right? Oh, absolutely. But listen, like I used to say in the beginning when it comes to Gad, and I'm going to get back to the book. Very early on in this walk, because, you know, I had never really, I had known maybe two Gadites, like legit Gadites, right? Uh, one of them was an older guy that used to work construction. And when we were in high school, we used to hang out like us in a group of, and we used to ride bike and stuff together. He was like a neighborhood guy. Rudy, his name was. That wasn't his real name. He had like a, yeah, I can't course. remember his native name. Yeah, yeah. His name was Rudy. And he lived with his moms uh, down the block from the school, right? Off of East Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. And uh, Rudy was great. You know, nowadays, people would look at that and be like, oh, my gosh, he must have been a perv or something like that. No, he was just a good guy that cared about, you know, we had met him because he saw us, like, kind of hanging out in front of the school one day. And he used to call us young bloods, And we would just talk and stuff like that. And, mm. I mean, the dude, it was never any type of weird stuff. He just, I guess, he never had any kids or anything. He was taking care of his mom. So he, he took kind of like a paternal thing onto us. And so he would, like, we because we would ride bike all over the Bronx to get, like, all over the place wherever we were hanging out. And uh, How old were you guys? Uh, 15. Oh, so he would buy you guys alcohol? No. Oh, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> not at all. Actually, hey, mister. we knew that if we were going to do that, we couldn't. Dude, Rudy, yeah. Rudy couldn't be around. Okay, okay. So Rudy was a good guy. Okay, Rudy, all right. Rudy okay. couldn't be around. Yeah. Jaguar Paul was. No, a good no, no, guy. no. Okay. We grew up in the Bronx, bro. We used to get alcohol from the bodega ourselves. Oh, that's true. That's, <laughs> true that's true. That's true. It was a struggle here for us. Yeah, you had to have a friend like that. Anyway, um, so my point with Gad is that I, I remember first coming into this truth, uh, and I said, "Man, I said, uh, how's twelve thousand Gadites and Rubenites got?" I said, "I don't even think there's twelve thousand." <laughs> Like and then a number that's gonna repent, and uh, now that our understanding has increased, understanding that you know, uh, hey, some of us may actually be Gadites. Mm -hmm. So not to say that you're not gonna have any from the reservations and stuff that won't repent. We have some brothers and sisters that are typical Gad, right, right? right. with us in in IUIC, and there's some in other camps, right? Um, and then there's others who are not typical. That's why I said we got to get out of the stereotype of what we think is a, a certain Gadites. tribe. Yeah. Right, Hollywood Gadites. Yeah. Um, and there's there's brothers that w were walking around professing Judah, and then they find out, nah, man, I'm straight up Gad, right? Or, mm -hmm. or Reuben, yep. you know? Uh, so the Most High has a setup that they will repent, and there is a number there for that, right? So, um, hey, uh, all praises. Guess what? Technically, I'm indigenous mm -hmm. because uh, I'm so-called Puerto Rican. Right, which yeah. before the Spaniards came here, we were calling ourselves Arawaks. Okay, um, so uh, we all Northern Kingdom is the real indigenous here, right? Even when we talk about going over the um, uh, migration that we took coming here, according to the Bible, so it says that Mexicans are not only early settlers, but they're also the largest group of new arrivals. And so that has to start making you think, gosh, so that means something must have happened. How were they here and then now are the largest group of new arrivals? Right. That yeah. doesn't make sense, right? Well, the border crossed them at some point. Yeah, right. Right. Now they talk about uh, Mexicans always crossing the border. A hey, quick, quick statement. Um, that was only one sentence and it's... There's no way we're getting through 15 minutes. No, <laughs> oh. no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to get it in. We're going to speed it up at some point. We're going to speed it up at some point. So... Uh, it says, uh, so many Mexicans have come since 1820 that they are now the largest immigrant national nationality in our history. No Hispanic group has contributed more to the nation's prosperity than Mexicans. And we're going to watch that when we watch, start watching the clip. Yet none makes white America more uneasy about the future. They fear us. They fear us. And you're going to see we got the table on the next page where they talk about uh, the different numbers, right, of legal immigration. This is from 1820 to 2008. 
And you'll see there's some close seconds and thirds there. But they're not afraid of those ones when they talk about those people migrating. They're afraid of our people. No, don't go there yet. I want to make sure there's nothing else uh, about here. Uh, okay, we're going to read on a little bit more. Just That's just the highlighted section, but there's a couple more. So it says, most troubling are the descendants of the Mexican pioneers. For once you admit Mexicans' long history on U.S. soil, you must necessarily accept Hispanic culture and the Spanish language as integral components of our own national saga. Mexicans, in fact, have lived here since before there was a Mexico or United States. And they have been coming to this country almost from its inception. Since 1820, when the federal government started keeping immigration records, Mexico has sent more paper here than any other nation. Whether or not Mexican immigration continues to surpass all others, as it has in recent decades, depends largely on what happens below the Rio Grande. We often forget that Mexico is the most populous Spanish-speaking country in the world. Mm -hmm. Still going into why most people will assume that if you're Spanish, you're Mexican. So I get it. I get where that comes from. But there's other... Uh, or if you're Levi, you're Mexican. Right, uh, right. There you go. So it says it has 95 million residents, a high birth rate. It's, it's a car be having babies. Oh, yeah. That's right. And desperate poverty. A disturbing portion of its national wealth flows outside its borders. I speak about that often on the show with the end of poverty, which eventually we'll probably touch on that documentary as well. Uh, each day into the pockets of Wall Street shareholders. So much of that wealth has been siphoned off in recent years that the Mexican economy finds it increasingly difficult to feed and clothe its population. If these conditions do not change, Mexico will remain an inexhaustible source of migrants to the United States, which is why Americans need to pay more attention to our southern neighbor than to what is happening in, say, Israel or Palestine, Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, but they don't, because what he's missing, the author here, because... He's caught up in, you know, the, the, the politics is what will save us and activism and all that other type of stuff is that it's by design, all of this. Right. So it's it's it, the, the thing is, nobody has presented the Bible to him in that way. So this is why, you, like you were saying at the beginning of the show, it's important that we bring out these other resources. Oh, you have to, bro. Because That's because by itself, uh, many of our people are not going to, you know, you got to presume you got to make the presumption. That not everybody's going to be at the level of understanding. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. right? We can't assume that everybody is already repenting and understands. So you got to bring this stuff out. Hey, and there's many people who follow us, who are members with us, who uh, express how things have been revealed to them on this show with mm -hmm. different history and things like that. Bro, in just that one sentence where it talks about the 95 million that are in poverty and desperate and, and all the resources are being siphoned to Black Wall Street— or not Black Wall Street, just Wall Street in general. Bro, that's freaking the curses in Deuteronomy 28 all day long, man. Come on. Yep. Come on, man. That's why we have to go to these sources to be able to, to tie these things in together. Uh, So look at a table. So it says all countries, immigration into the United States, 74 million. From 1820 to 2008, 74 million have come here, right? This is from statistics that they started keeping from 1820. Mexico's number one on the list. This is as of 2008, right? And this is, this is legal immigration. Yeah, right. I think if you count illegal immigration, they're probably uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, 7,476,092. And look at that close second. Germany, right behind them. But you don't hear, you don't hear uh, uh, the anti-immigration policies talking about, what well, damn, all these Germans are coming here. No, in fact, the uh, politicians the want to trade our people for, for those type of countries. Right, right, yeah. Then Trump said, why can't we trade them? Why, why can't we get people from, why do we get people from shithole countries, he yeah. said, right? <laughs> what the hell is this? Uh, Italy, uh, United Kingdom, Ireland, Canada, Austria, Hungary. Isn't that where Schwarzenegger is from? Yeah. Get to the chopper. Yeah. Right. Bro, like, Bring um, more of those, they from, say. From Germany on down, it's all the same people. That's why there's that, no that, issues yes, with them. Yes, it it's all the same people. That's it's all the right. same people. Just according to the history with the Tower of Babel, that's why they all think they're someone else and they all speak different tongues. Because the Most High confused the languages, so the ones that the ones that were babbling nonsense that sounded like their nonsense, they said, "Okay, let's be one people." Look, <laughs> the other one said, "Here, let's be another people." They don't care about Germany coming or Italy coming and so on and so forth because the Scripture says that Israel will be more and mightier than we, right? So, like, they see the number of Mexicans that came over, and then that scares them. That yeah. that, that puts that fright in them. Yep, absolutely. So 
It says Mexican Americans, meanwhile, face a frustrating identity problem similar to that of Puerto Ricans. So, so when we were in, we were in Puerto Rico, I must I must tell the story because like, we've joked about it on the group. All right. So uh, and we have the Northern Kingdom Spanish travel group and, they, and, and we've joked about it. And people are like, oh, what's the joke? Officer Cornelius. Right. Um, great brother to have on these trips, bro. brother. I mean, if you follow him in the Spanish, you see him and all that stuff. Real great zeal when he's teaching and stuff. Like he's he's one of my he's one of my mainstays when I take a trip. I'm like, bro, you available? Let's go. He was teaching, bringing fire, bro, lighting up, lighting up. Uh, I'm gonna say Puerto Ricans because you're not Ephraim until you start to repent. Lighting right. up Puerto Ricans right. up. Bring it out. And bro, breaking it down, showing boom. And then so the brother asked him, where where you from? And he was like, listen, I'm I, I would be deemed a Mexican, but I'm the tribe of Israel. He said, oh, you're a Mexican. Right, and then this guy was walking by in the background, and, and he was scoffing for like the the rest of the time there. Pinche mexicano, oh, pinche mexicano, <laughs> Cállate. Yeah, he was saying, he said, "You damn, I'm being nice. You nice. damn Mexican." He said, "Be quiet. Why are you talking?" Yo, Cornelius went. You mad at me because I told you I'm Mexican? He yeah. was like, bro, we just say, see, somebody else that would not been in the spirit would have just been all pissed off at that point. Brother held his composure and he blasted him and he said, hey, we're the same people. Yeah. You're over here talking about all this stuff, right? Yet, I, when I read this, I thought about that because it says, hey, we, we, we're we very similar when it comes to our identity problem here in, the, here in the United States. Like you said earlier, they think Puerto Rico is a city in Mexico, yeah, most right. people here. That's weird. I've been to Cancun and, and, and Puerto Vallarta, but where is but where's Puerto Rico? <laughs> Puerto <and> Vallarta. <laughs> right. So it says uh, they are both native-born, right? So the brother earlier has said, I'm indigenous. I'm indigenous too, bro. They are both native-born and immigrants, pioneers and aliens, right? Later we'll talk about Lamentations 5. All right. Um, actually, we may bring it out in a second, and then we're going to revisit it. Some of the scriptures we're going to talk about today, we're going to hit them multiple times as we get the different examples in the show. Lamb right. 5. Right, Lamb 5. I wrote it there, I Lamb 5. Right. Oh, you understood that? That's didn't good. look like Hebrew. No, that's good. Okay, <laughs> right? Uh, I keyed in on that word, right? Because they call they call us aliens. Mm -hmm. But he's, th he's basically making an argument here, like we're going to read in Lamentations 5 in a moment. Uh, and to me, it's like, what? Well, there's a different way to bring out Lamentations 5. He says they are both native-born and immigrants, pioneers and aliens, patriots and rebels. Meaning why? We went over the show where we spoke about the Borinqueneers and how we fought in almost every war mm -hmm. um, except the, like, well, on record, right? We probably did fight in the Civil War, too, uh, because we were slaves then oh, as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, so patriots because... Not only did we serve, many of our people do serve mm -hmm. in this military and rebels as well. Because what? At times, we've had to go ahead and take a stand against the atrocities that are going on here. Right. right? So we've we've we spoke about the revolutionaries. Right. And the rebels. We started with the rebels. We started with the Brown Berets. We were speaking about the young lords. Right. Um, so he's saying we're patriots and rebels. And, and that goes the same. We spoke about that, how the Brown Berets, you had the young lords. Right which were basically both forms of the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. So what the Black Panthers was for Judah, the Young Lords was for Ephraim, and the Brown Berets was for Issachar. And plus, when we had the doctor on the show, he said that they were basically trading like back and he forth. He said they traded talents with each other. Yeah. Brothers saw the similarities in their movements, and when we watch the clip, mm -hmm. you're going to see the author of this book when he speaks, and he talks... No, it's not the author. It might be somebody else. But he talks about... No, as a matter of fact... Of all people, it's Jesse Jackson that talks about our plights are the same. And that made me think about these foolish people who try to talk about that Northern Kingdom's not who the Bible says Northern Kingdom is. The Mexicans ain't our people. Them Hispanics ain't our people. Man, there's so much similarities to what the Bible says on curses and to what we experience historically together. You can't make no division in that. You're feeding into the bands being cast asunder with that madness. So he says, no matter how far back some may trace their ancestry on our soil, they are still battling to emerge from the obscure margins of U official U.S. history. That's by design because they consulted against our hidden ones, right? Meaning against God's hidden ones, meaning the Israelites, which is us. Uh, still clamoring to be fully recognized and understood. As we will see in the following story of one pioneer Mexican-American family, the Canales clan of South Texas. Now, we're not going to get into the whole family heritage of it, 
But this particular family was very important historically through um, what transpired with Mexico over the over the last uh, 200 years. All right. Um, so he kind of traces a lot. They, they were very influential in a lot of things that went on, whether it be for good or bad. But let's get Lamentations five and one. All right. Let's Bring talk about out. that real quick, because he, he gave such a, a, a great explanation here for it. And I got to pair it with the scripts. I got to pair it with the scripts because it, it's a, such a great explanation for it. The book of Lamentations, chapter five and verse one. Bring Remember, O oh Lord. What has come upon us. Right. And you got to listen. First, this remember starts with remembering our biblical history. Right. Mm -hmm. Remembering our captivities. Uh, actually, even before that, remembering what happened with Adam. Remembering what happened uh, with uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Remembering what happened to us in Egypt. Remembering what happened to us in Assyria. Remembering what happened to us in Babylon. What remember that happened to us with the Persian Medes? What happened to us with the Greeks? What happened to us with the Romans? What happened to us with the Spanish and the British? Mm. And what became the Italians? What happened to us with the Dutch and the Portuguese? What happened to us with the United States of America? Bringing it all up to, up to speed. Going through that. So you start with your biblical history, and then you got to get into this type of history. It's important that we remember that stuff. All right? So it says, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Come on. Consider and behold our reproach. And we have to, we're telling, we're telling the Most High, hey, consider and behold our reproach. And you don't think the Most High doesn't know that? Well, it's us acknowledging mercy. This goes also with 1 Kings 8 when it says we, we acknowledge our, our offenses. Mm. So we say, hey, consider and behold our reproach. Starting to let the Most High know, hey, man, we, 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 we understand. We, we understand, man. <laughs> we messed up. Most high, look at us now. Yep. Right? Because the prophecy was that we would be without a king, without an ephod, without a face, right? right? That he would hide his face from us. So now we're asking him to shine his face upon us again. Just like you read in the in the um the anointing, where it says, Let your face shine upon us, let your countenance be with us. Right. Because in that anointing, that's a blessing. And it's a blessing to have the most high conscious and aware of us you read in psalms 8 and it talks about all the creation and everything that's great in that and we're small compared to that right. if you think about the moon the sun the stars the universe the forest the mountains the waterfalls oceans lakes rivers of the of, of the world and yet he pays attention to us like he doesn't pay attention to anything else right. that's a blessing that's an honor that's that's love and that's a love that you cannot know. Out of all those things, he looks at us. It tells you he made us a little less than the angels. Like, even he pays attention to us more than the angels. And Esau knows that, man. There's a show, Supernatural. I'm going to get back on track with this, where the angels rebel against God in that show. I used to watch it because it's just sci-fi and fantasy. I like that sort of stuff. And the angels rebel against God, right? Of course, God is white in, in the show. But they did have black Bruh. angels. Uh, the angels rebel against God because they're jealous because he liked the humans so much. Right. So they twist it a little bit. They pervert it. Right. Bruh. In that. But that's not the case because the angels do what the Most High tells them to do. There's With no rebellion. Fear. Right. There's no rebellion in heaven. They're, they're, they're one. Right. Like that, that's the real understanding of what the Trinity. Right. That they say it's yeah. the same person is. It's that. Uh, uh, God, Christ, and the host of heaven are in one accord, right? So there's no disagreement in heaven. But anyway, they understand that, and they 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 take a, a play on that with twisting that. So what the point that I'm making is that it's important that we entreat the Lord in that manner and understand that. So this is pretty heavy when you talk about what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. It's a reproach because he made us to be above all things in the earth. Right. Above every single thing. So then why are we the least and the basis? We're letting him know we understand now, God. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to understand that identity and that history. You know, uh, uh, our, our naysayers try to come, because we, we are never gainsaid. Our naysayers try to come and say that we're teaching division, that uh, why do you harp on your slaveries and all that other stuff? Because that is our reproach. <laughs> Through those captivities, they ain't nothing. What, listen. That's why, what does Esau do to punish you for a crime? They take away your freedom. Mm -hmm. right. 
And when your freedom is taken away in the prison systems, it's some of the most horrific places that you can be. It's not anywhere near what slavery is like and was like for us, but it's a, it's a similar type of construct. So taking away your freedom when you're supposed to be the rulers of the earth. Here it is. Right? Here it is. Is a reproach. Because how can, uh, uh, that's when he says you see uh, kings, uh, servants upon horses and kings on foot. Right? That's what it's talking about. So we must always bring that stuff out. And one of those things and the ways we do it is by bringing out different history like this. Come on, read on. Verse 2. Our inheritance is turned to strangers. Our houses to aliens. We are going to dissect that today. That's what we're speaking about today. It says our inheritance is turned to strangers and our houses to aliens. We were reading here in the book. It says Mexican-Americans, meanwhile, face a frustrating identity problem similar to that of Puerto Ricans. They are both native born because it's our inheritance. Like you read in Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. This side of the land, when we settled here, when we migrated here, mm-hmm. like you read in 2 Ezra 13, was our inheritance from God on this side of the world. So it says we are native born and immigrants, pioneers and aliens. So it tells you here, this, this breaks that down perfect what we're reading here. Our inheritance was this land. What did they take from us? This land and our rights with it. It was turned to strangers or houses to aliens. And now they call us those aliens. They call us those strangers. Puerto Ricans are freaking American citizens. You wouldn't think that the way the hell they they, they treated us after the Hurricane Maria. People were like, nah, hell no, don't help them. Yeah, right. Bro, that's like saying something goes down in Texas and you're like, nah, don't help them out. Too many people that speak Spanish over there, don't help them out. You, it, it, you wouldn't think of it. It's unfathomable. As a matter of fact, uh, first responders rep- uh, uh, from all over the country go to help out when there's a natural disaster here in the United States mainland. Right. Now, I'm not saying that some didn't try to go to Puerto Rico. It's nowhere near the response when something goes down here. You know, okay, it's kind of like when you're waiting at the light to turn and someone's walking across and they give that fake hustle to try to... Give oh, off the, 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 fake, the fake run. Yeah, so they <laughs> so they pump their arms a little faster to, to right. give the appearance that they're trying to hu- hurry up for you. Right. I mean, I mean, time. we appreciate that, but you didn't really do nothing. Right. It's the same thing. Right. It's the same exact thing. Hey, right. Cap, can I get a script real quick? Go ahead, bro. Give me a uh, Jeremiah thirty-one verse nineteen. Hold a uh, hold hold Lamb five. Hold Lamb five because I'm pretty sure that we're, we're coming back to that because there's a, there's a lot of meat on that bones. But give me Jeremiah thirty-one verse nineteen. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 31 and verse 19. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thighs. So when we go into the scripts and bring up the curses, we, we go into these books, these documentaries, all these different resources that God allowed us to use in these last days. It says that we repented and we were instructed and we smote on the thigh like, damn, the most I chose us above all nations, but yet we continue to be rebellious against the one true God. Read. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. You're supposed to be ashamed and confounded when you realize, according to the scriptures, the curses and everything else, that you fit the people of the book. You're supposed to feel ashamed because like how Captain was saying, God chose us and he sees us special above everybody else. And you can see that we bear the reproach of our youth because we were rebellious as hell. Yeah, that's right. That's was right. that uh, Hebrews where he said uh, he was ashamed of us? He's ashamed to be our God. Oh, it well because it talks about where he won't be ashamed to be our God. Is that right. is I think that's Hebrews eleven where it speaks about that. Right. Um, is it Hebrews? 11? I could be wrong, but I believe it's Hebrews. Hebrews eleven. You're right. I have brought it out uh, one In time. I know what you're talking about. Uh, I think it was. I was talking about um, faith. Yeah, when it's confess that we're strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Uh, hold on. Where is it at? And surely if they've been mindful, they right. And but now they say, yeah. Okay, so you know what? He start here, start at thirteen. Hebrews eleven and thirteen. Mm-hmm. The book mm-hmm. of Hebrews, chapter eleven and verse thirteen. Freedom! These all died in faith. Right. So he was reading about some of our forefathers to speak about how they all displayed their faith by works. 
right, by actions, mm -hmm. because faith is not a fe you can't display a feeling without an action behind it. Right. So faith is not a feeling, right? Faith is is a driver of action in yeah. this walk. That's not faith. That's faith. That's F A I F. Right. That's feign faith. That's feign faith. Right. Bring it out. <laughs> these are all. So he says these all died in faith. Come on. Not having received the promises. They didn't. They didn't get the kingdom of heaven, but they f they acted like they were going to get it at any moment. Come on. But having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them. They were able to see them because they understood the scripture. They understood the promises. Their belief, even though knowing that they probably were not going to get it now or in their lifetime, it says they were persuaded of them. It motivated them. Come on. And what and what come of that? And embraced them. And they embraced them. Come on. And confessed that they were strangers. You know what that confessed that they're strangers? That's Lamentations 5 where it says, consider and behold our reproach. It is. Right, right. Remember all that's come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. So it says they confessed that they were strangers. Come on. And pilgrims on the earth. And pilgrims on the earth. Meaning that we're here temporarily. Our people have made the mistake that this is our rest. Our people have made the mistake. That's like you, you post up in a nice hotel and you think you're home. It's not home. Right. It's temporary. It's not yours. And at any moment you can be kicked out. I mean, it's yours until 11 a.m. Right. <laughs> the day of checkout. I mean, it's uh, yours until right, 11 a.m. Right, un, un, unless you have the late checkout, then right. it's yours until noon. Right. But that's right. about it. Come on. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. See, and that's what our people don't understand, right? Be because that, that original country, that original inheritance, going back to what Cap brought out. There it is. Is the circle of the earth. That, that's the border of righteousness. It's the whole. That's the border of righteousness. It's the earth and everything in it. That's what the real inheritance is that what we're striving for now. God gave a smaller inheritance with partitions of land in the earth, but we're going to get the whole thing. Lord's will life last and we and we repent and keep these commandments till we die or till Christ's return. So it says, but they that say these things declare plainly that they seek a country. Come on. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. Not Mexico, not Puerto Rico, not Africa. It's talking about Eden, starting with Eden and what the whole earth was supposed to be for us. That's why I say it goes all the way back to Adam. Mm -hmm. It's not even talking about Israel under the kings because it wasn't even great under the kings either, as great as you might read how wealthy and how our rulership was. Right. right? It wasn't what it was supposed to be. So it says, and if they had been mindful of that country, how were we not mindful? We rebelled against God by not keeping his commandments. We kept that inheritance. We keep the, that land. We keep those promises. Should we have done what we were supposed to do? But we did it. Come on. They might have had opportunity to have returned. Right. Meaning the most high after he kicked out Adam was trying to find a way to get him back. There were steps that he was taking to prove us to get us back into that stuff. Right. But we're delaying that because we know that until the 144,000 are sealed, Christ is not returning to give it back to us. And then you know that to be true because Deuteronomy 28, the first 14 verses start with if you keep the commandments, then you'll get these blessings. Is that right? right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Come on. But now they desire a better country. He says, listen, now we desire a better country above Mexico, above uh, Peru, Venezuela, Panama, Guatemala, Puerto Rico. Right. Above the reservation. Above what was the United, uh, what what what's now called the United States, mm -hmm. he says we desire a better country. Come on, that is and heavenly, which means rulership. Because in these countries, even where we may have elected leaders, that's the whole point of this series that we're going over with the Harvest of Empire. And and listen, we're not talking about the School of the Americas heavy today, but it's gonna come back as we continue to go through this Lord's will. Hey, all right, hey Cap, it says. A better country. And you were saying Mexico, U U.S., and everything else. But, man, let's bring it to our people that are really destroyed. More than a zip code. More than an area code. You're right, right? about right. that. You're right about that. More than a corner. Yeah, right. Dying over blocks. Right, exactly. More than a block. You go, you uh, you call that you call that macro and micro. Mm -hmm. Macro is the whole uni the earth and the universe and everything. Right? And then you get smaller and smaller and smaller. More than your sidewalk. Because you got some people... Who they think that because they got a house and some land that they've arrived. Yep. Right. More than a curb. So it says we want a heavenly one where we rule, where we're in rulership. And you know what real rulership is? You don't have to compromise your ways for the most powerful country in the world. Right. That's how you know it's not heavenly. You say, oh, but we got we got our own elected leaders in some of our countries. 
Listen, look at what's going on in Venezuela as a result of that. When we talk about Cuba next week, well, I don't know. We might have to do a Mexico part two, so I don't know. We'll see. When we talk about Cuba. <laughs> Cuba. When we talk about Cuba. When we talk about Cuba. When we talk about Cuba, <laughs> all right, you're going to see, okay, how, how America moves, right? It don't matter that you have your own leadership. So heavenly means us in rulership. Come on. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Where it says God is not ashamed to be called their God. Letting you know that in this time, for those who are not repenting, God is ashamed to be called our God. Bro, it's, it, it's, and then to put it into a carnal sense, it's the same thing when you were a child and you did something bad and your, and your parents said, I'm not mad at you, I'm just disappointed in you. Hey, well, like, what about, oh, what about wait, yeah. what about this one? My mom used to tell me, you get a girl pregnant under my roof, I'm disowning you. Yeah, there you go. That one too. Because it's a shame. Mm-hmm. It was a shameful thing. Not anymore. Not in, not in this America. Not in 2019, 2021. Now it's, now it's get on up and shake that book. Now it's whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to pop. I don't want to pop. Yeah, now it's way different now. Hey, let me tell you, that also brings new understanding where it says, uh, uh, I see a new thing enough, a woman shall compass a man. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of sisters want to run with that and mean that they they that means see that means we prophetesses and and we know more than you. No, most I was talking about this feminist movement. Right. That he was seeing that far ahead that he's talking about this feminist movement. See, they were thinking that meant that they were going to be powerful. What it meant is that the divine order was going to be perverted. And if that's the case, then why is there a Revelation fourteen and four when it says that these are they that were not defiled with boom, women? Boom, boom. Come on, boom. man. Come on. Listen, it, it's talking about philosophies bing, first and foremost. Bing, bing, just but then it's talking about the literal <laughs> woman, man. Come Yo, on. That's it. That's it. So it says, uh, reverse sixteen again. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. So it says, when you start to repent. Right, because when you desire that country, remember what we read up in 13, right? Where it says they saw it afar off, they were persuaded of them and embraced them. Mm-hmm. And then they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. He says, then God is no longer ashamed of you. Mm-hmm. Right. But when you're all about keeping this country going, keeping the status quo going, keeping this earth going the way it is, he says he is ashamed of you. Mm-hmm. Our God has been ashamed of us for far too long. <laughs> and it's time that we bring this understanding out so that we wake up where he is not ashamed. To be called our God. Come on. For he hath prepared for them a city. Yeah, that 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 golden city. The the new Jerusalem, mm-hmm. which is gonna be the capital of the whole world. That's, That's right. what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. Let's go to let's go to the documentary. Let's let's break it up a little bit. We're reading, we're whatever. I'll come back to my <laughs> my pages on the thing here. All right. Let's begin. Blow it up, B. Sounds low. Maybe it's my headphones. Nah. It's like faint in the back. Any summer since 1994, when this wall was put up, more people died those summers than the entire history of the Berlin Wall. Marco Antonio Villasenor, the five-year-old boy that dies with 18 men. Lucrecia Dominguez, the woman that dies in the arms of Jesus, her 15-year-old son. Anastasio Hernandez, stomped and, and tasered to death by the Border Patrol in customs. Stop, stop. 2010. And I want to make a little point here, right? Because uh, he's about to say that, that, that nobody tells these stories. That's part of that crafty counsel and that division of casting brands or something. I've said this before on this show. Because uh, as he's saying the names... And there's just a handful of the names. It makes me think of how, you know, when we talk about Judah and we see all the names of, of the our brothers and sisters that were wrongfully killed, mm-hmm. right? And um, that list is just as large. Mm-hmm. It's just as large as what you see in that. And, and, and those are the names that we know about. He said from a certain time period there in just that year alone that there was more people that died at that wall than the entire history of the, of the Berlin Wall. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's insane. An entire history, right? And they'll and they'll have you believe communism is the worst thing uh, mm-hmm. on on the planet. And I'm not saying I'm pro any of that stuff. I'm not politically aligned at all. My politics are God's politics. That's how I roll it. Right. But 
letting you know because they were under a lot of atrocities. Yeah, East Berlin, West Berlin, right? So he's saying then, then at any time where, where those type of things were going on over there, in this one year, he said more uh, of Issachar died, right? Yeah. By border patrol agents, not because of the, the wildness of crossing the border, by border patrol. There's a lot of stuff that goes on with that border patrol and ICE and all that stuff. There's a lot of people that are motivated, right, uh, to to be in that because they know they're gonna get to uh, uh, hurt some yeah, yeah. Mexicans. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, Cap. Um, before this truth, there's a a documentary, and I think it's on YouTube. But there's uh, Edomites, Caucasian people, that do voluntary work at the border just to catch Mexicans. Yeah. Oh, they have their own patrols that they go out there. Hey, hey, and, and hey, there's a lot of land out there, man, and there don't be a lot of cops out there, you know. No, and and all, I know, bro. and I know the I eight's not the whole border, but there's stretches of that I eight, man, where there's they ain't no cops, they ain't nobody out there. Bro, and the, and, and the, as uh, they're crossing that border, them 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 uh corn fed hillbillies, <laughs> they out bro, there doing patrol, shooting them down. The border is way too big to have somebody patrolling the entire border at all times. It's yeah. just way too much. But hey, hey Shia, there's there was nothing prior to this truth, all right? Just just so you know, all right. <laughs> Good. People don't want to hear these stories. But these are stories that people need to hear. People do not want to leave their homeland. They don't want to leave their culture, their families, their language, what they're used to. Why would you want to pick up and leave like this? It's like often, it, it reminds me of a similar question where nobody ever asked why your own people would sell your own people, mm -hmm. supposedly, dealing with the transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. to show that there's a division. Like, you had Hamites. It wasn't really Israelites selling Israelites to the white man. It was right. Hamites that were doing that stuff, right? So he's telling you the same thing. He goes, nobody ever stops and thinks about that. Why would they want to leave a place where, the, where, where their family is, where, yeah. where their language is, where their culture is? There's things that drive that, and nobody ever has that question. And like I said... Uh, I think we had well, on last week's show we had brought it out where where the the Guatemalan sister said uh, people have no idea why we migrate and why we're willing to take those type of risks to come here and if they do it's the wrong idea they think it's because uh, well we got the goods America's so great so we're gonna come here right. no I got nothing to do with that come on why does it take so long for you to hit play when I say come on. Of course, you really can't tell the story of Latinos in America without dealing with the Mexican population, because Mexicans are by far the largest group of the Latino population in the United States. Most people are not aware. Hey, and that's another thing. That's why, you know, Ephraim historically was the head tribe, right? And you know that, that, that the way that structure is set up. But because of the dynamics of what we're going over today, you understand why you actually there's a lot more Issachar in the body than right. there are of some of the other Northern Kingdom tribes. Oh, yeah. That's but, right. but I'm going to tell you something. That's going to change. That's going to change for be the Lord's will as we continue to venture out. Because guess what? He's telling you Issachar is the largest group here, which is why just by the numbers alone, they would be the largest groups of people here in the United States with IUIC that we have. There was so much untapped of our tribes that we got to go hit. Right. That we got to go hit. Hey, we got some intel on Panama today. If it be the Lord's will, we'll set up a trip before the end of the year is out. It, we we, we, we going to move. We got a lot of good brothers that have been diligent. We're trying some of these men out on the trips. They're doing good so far. You know, we, we lacked the personnel before to make an impact, and we did not have the resources. This is why it's important that you donate to the Booster Club. You see the activities that we're doing to move that along, all right? Um, with the full support of our, our senior leadership, they're saying, listen, go out, do your thing. You brothers have built up your reputations. You've shown that you can handle this and be on one accord and spread the word this way. Let's go out and do that stuff. That's another reason it's so important that we all speak the same thing and stuff mm -hmm. like that so that we can continue to multiply and grow and do that stuff. So we got to get out of the United States to hit a bulk of this northern kingdom repenting. They're not all going to come from here. They're not. They're not. Go ahead. That since 1820, when the United States first started gathering immigration statistics, there has been no nation in the world that has sent more people to the United States 
than Mexico. And we're talking about legal immigration. More legal Mexican immigrants have come to this country since 1820 than the Irish, than the Germans, than the French, than any other population. The reality is that great swaths of the United States and the West were originally part of Mexico. California, oh, it's Will. Nevada. We'll, we'll, we'll show more, uh, a more detailed map of what was uh, Mexico before... They like to use the term annex. I like to say stole, robbed, yeah. you know. Mexico is almost as big as the U.S. when it actually was. Yeah, well, you know these maps are all jacked up, too. It probably probably was bigger than the U.S., the way, they, right. the way they draw stuff out. Uh, go back just a few seconds because he named some of the states that it, 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 the states, what they're called today, that, are, that was Mexico. Than the French, than any other population. The reality is that great swaths of the United States and the West were originally part of Mexico. California, Nevada, parts of Utah, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado. That was all the Northern Territory of Mexico and there were Mexican citizens living on that land before it became part of the United States. As they say in, in South Texas or in, in Northern New Mexico, Southern Colorado, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Mexico was in those places. They'll tell you we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Oh, I never claimed it was mine. I'm, I'm just <laughs> I just said I made it the title of the show. That's good. That's good. That's good. Right. The border crossed us. That goes back to that Lamentations five that we were reading, mm -hmm. where it says our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. This was our territory, and we never left. You just changed the the lines of who owned what. That's essentially what happened. You redrew some lines on a map and said this was yours now. And the they told us this? that we had to stop doing things our way. We had to stop speaking Spanish. We had to stop having our culture. We had to get taxed by you now. We had yep. to register certain things. Just changed the whole game up, but kept them there. We became their possession. Oh, wait. You right. Wait. Play. White aware He's all that the now. U.S. was coming and that they were willing to expand themselves everywhere possible, especially in those areas of North America that formerly belonged to Spain, then to Mexico, but were empty, almost empty. It was a very tempting piece of land there. Mexico City said, well, we cannot really defend the northern part of our new republic unless we have a demographic push there. But we don't have enough people in Mexico to fill that empty space. Why don't invite foreigners? Why don't invite Catholic foreigners? And you know that, that that's the spirit of the Most High yep. that put that thing because it had to be. It had to be. So what he's explaining here, right, in case some of you don't don't realize what's happening. So he says uh, Spain wound up pushing forward and conquering a lot of this stuff. Because I often hear, well, that was Gadite territory. Well, the, you know, the history only goes back so far to, to, to prove it out. That doesn't seem to be the case, regardless of what Gas says, because we don't have the records that really shows that. I'm not saying Mexicans didn't fight with Gadites. I mean, we all had different beefs and stuff like that. We just spoke about that a little earlier. Uh, but he says the land was not heavily populated. There's no way they they, they kicked out all the Gadites, right? Yeah, right? So it was land that just wasn't that heavily populated. Um, and remember, they, they, they talk to you a lot about Gad, and you'll see different maps. Again, I, I'm I'm not saying I'm totally versed on this stuff, right, fully. Uh, but I'm trying to paint a picture for y'all. So he says that the land was so massive. The maps don't do it justice, how, how much land is out in the west, southwest, northwest, mm -hmm. right? Um and that they didn't have enough of a population that far north after they got their independence from Spain, right? You can look up the history and stuff like that. And uh, basically he's saying that if they would have had the manpower, they could have defended against the United States and other countries. Yeah. But what they realized is that they didn't. So they said they made a deal with the devil, essentially. And they said, let's get 
some Edomites to come here, right? That'll maybe open things up a little bit out here, right? Where we don't have to worry about defending the land and our borders so much. And uh, at the same time, let's do Catholic ones because they seem all right. They seem all right. They come in with their religion. Their tenets seem like what it is. So Christianity, always in the mix. Mm -hmm. One of the elements that that, that uh, Esau uses, Christianity and politics. And what you're seeing time and time again when it comes to the history of our people is, is that's the two-pronged approach that they come and hit us with. It's Christianity, which starts with Catholicism because they're the father of all Christian denominations. And uh, politics, right? democracy. And that's what they come with. So they started off where they invited these people. And he's going to explain a little more what really happened. They, they invite, You know how like a vampire, they say you can't come in unless you invite them in? Yeah. That's kind of what they did. And, they, and he surely sucked the blood out of our people. Go ahead. The Irish that were already coming to the U.S., let us receive them with open arms. But at the end... Right, they try to talk about, oh, we weren't accepted here either, and we were in captivity and all this other stuff. Them freaking Irish, which is still Esau, it's the same people, right, came and they, and they were the architects, the beginning of the demise of what you see today. It's been a lasting effect of what's happened to Issachar. When, when you're brought over on a ship and you're in it docks and you walk off and then you go register somewhere and you're giving a job, is far different than being over, brought over on a ship in 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 shackles and chains, being drug off the ship and then sold on auction blocks. Mm -hmm. Oh come on, stop! Yep, I can't stand that comparison, yeah. bro. It they were me recruited off. to come. Mm -hmm. They were recruited to come because Esau also knew. Well, damn, we ain't got enough of the Brits coming over. Yeah, which is their own people, right? So they, they, I mean, they're all their own people, but at that time, their own nation. So they said, you know what? Let's invite the Irish. It's they dealing man. with some stuff over there. Let's invite it's the man. Irish. These guys can drink whiskey and, and yeah. still work all day. Right. So right. <laughs> so they sent propaganda over there to bring the Irish over. Go ahead. God, why it take so long? <laughs> the Irish that were already coming to the U.S. Let us receive them with open arms. But at the end, they were not Irish. They were not Catholic, and they brought the slaves. Most of the settlers who moved into Texas. He said at the end of the day, so it, it, he, he's not saying that it wasn't Irish. He's saying that others, others wound up taking that invitation and coming too. But he's letting you know that the Irish had slaves too. He said, and they brought the slaves because they said, we got all this land. Who's going to work it? Surely yeah, not yeah, by right. our hands. Yeah, right. So we're going to bring some more slaves over here. Come on. This came from the southern states. Many of them were slave owners themselves so they naturally saw texas as an area for expansion of slavery in america but as more americans heard that so they saw texas as an area of expansion for america right and they said man okay they're opening the arms to us we're gonna come in and we're gonna take we're gonna make this more the united states mm -hmm. Right. I think we had done it on this show where we saw uh, we showed a map of how the United States grew from yeah, yeah, the colonies did. to yeah. all the land they annexed and stuff like that. Right. Um, that's that manifest destiny stuff. We'll see if we talk about it, if we have time. But go ahead. Moved into Texas. They suddenly began confronting the reality that the Mexican government had abolished slavery. We believe in slavery. We want to bring slaves here so that we can really do well out here in this land. Right. But as long as Mexico's governing, we can't have slaves. So this is not working. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Now we start to open up the door and see yep. what they're real. You know, I got to read about the Manifest Destiny. Let's go to the Manifest Destiny thing. All right. Come up later because we'll talk about the Mexican-American War. Lord's will. If not, we'll, we'll talk about it next week. We got like maybe 40 minutes left. No, 30, 40. We got like, no. We started like at 7.05. Let's see. Uh, manifest destiny, right? This is the belief that they had. They called it American progress. That's the name of that picture. That If, you, if you're familiar, we've spoken about it on the show before. But that's a familiar picture, American progress. Uh, it's an allegorical, meaning it's a, it's a similitude, representation of the modernization of the New West. Blow up the picture a little bit. Uh, 
Okay, and I still want to be able to read the thing. Are we able to read it as we look at the picture? There we go. So, a personification of the United States is shown leading civilization westward with the American settlers. That personification is that whore, that great harlot. It's no coincidence that it's a woman in that personification. You read that in Revelations where it talks about that whore that sits on many waters, right? There's a reason it preferred to her as a woman because that's what they chose, right, In this, through the spirit of this artist, all right? That's what was put out in that. So they say that's the representation of the modernization of the New West, right? That that image's name is called Columbia, right? That 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 personification, that whore. Notice she has the that's I think that's supposed to be a Bible in her hand, uh, and then she has like a lasso, right? And no, I'm sorry. So that lasso is the uh, the telegraph lines, mm -hmm. right? That she's bringing forward. And uh, look, at she's supposed to be, oh, she's so angelic and all this other. She looks like a demon to me now that, now that you got the proper understanding to know what demons are. It says, send in the white woman. Right. Go ahead. Send in the white woman. Uh, like it's Caitlin shown Jenner. leading civilization westward with the American settlers. They call them settlers. They Those are robbers and thieves. Okay. Uh, keep uh, Go ahead. Keep going. I want to I wanna read more. Hey, I want to read that part down there. Okay. The painting shows the manifest destiny, the belief that the United States should expand from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. In 1872, artist John Gass painted a popular scene of people moving west that captured the view of Americans at the time, called the spirit of the frontier. And he says that was the view of Americans at the time. That's still their view. And widely distributed as an engraving portraying settlers moving west. Guided and protected by Columbia, who represents America and is dressed in a Roman toga. So you got, man, you got these people out here, you got these apologists, these Christian groups saying, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. America is Rome. America is this, America is that. They don't get it. Yet they, here, here's an example of them telling them themselves. So it says it's, it's the, a, a woman who represents America. That's the, so the, Im, the name of that image is Columbia, right? A woman who represents America and is dressed in a Roman toga to represent classical republicanism. Uh, and aided by technology, right? So that's their witchcraft. They came with technology, railways, telegraph, driving Native Americans and bison into obscurity. The technology shown in the picture is used to represent the outbursts of innovation and invention of modern technology. It is also important to note that Columbia is bringing the light as witness on the eastern side of the painting as she travels towards the dark and west. So uh, show the whole picture so we show that part. You look at the right of the picture as they're coming from where they've already set up America, right? What was then uh, America, the United States. It's all light, bright. Uh, the sun is coming up over the clouds. And as they go into the west, you see Gad there fleeing, right? Right. Some of them are, are waving them on because of that invitation that we spoke about. But some of them are fleeing. You see the bison fleeing. That reminds me of the curses in Deuteronomy where it talks about our oxen. There, there's the bear right there at the bottom fleeing. The bear is fleeing. A coyote. Bro, right. that's, that's, that's Romans when it says that the earnest expectation is that the creature, you know, like the creature. Right. The earnest expectation of the creature. Romans 8, 19. Await if the manifestation of the sons of God. Look at the mountains, how black and leery are. Yeah, you know what reminds me of? Mordor. In, in Lord of the Rings, yeah, right. they're trying to make it seem like, like it's all jacked up and all dark. Her, so her they're book. coming with light. They're coming with technology. They're coming to enlighten and civilize yeah. us. What the hell is this? Crazy. Yeah. Her, her book says school book. It's a school book. Yeah, and then, mm. and, then and then there's a uh, there's a five pointed star on top of her head. School book. It says, "Wow, look at a five pointed star." That's Moloch, Remfam. They come in with idolatries and the school system. That's heavy that they come in with the school system because that lets you know, um, like what they did the Indian schools. What we spoke about that we did a two part yeah. show on that. Uh, they spoke about um, uh, there's even they even have Mexican boarding schools, right? And the school system, when we went over agents of socialization, is a construct of how they maintain control, right? Mm -hmm. So her her feet are all dirty. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go back to the uh, to the to the dirty, documentary. Dirty cave woman feet. Actually, uh, no. Let's finish reading this from Manifest Destiny. Let's go back to the the actual wiki link, and then we'll go back to the documentary. Uh, okay. Manifest destiny was a widely held cultural belief. I, I take issue with was. 
It is. Mm -hmm. A widely held cultural belief in the 19th century United States that American settlers were destined to expand across North America. Uh, there are three basic themes to manifest destiny. The special virtues of the American people and their institutions. So they really felt that it was spiritual. When they were virtuous in what they were doing. The mission of the United States to redeem and remake the West in the image of the agrarian East. So that was these these are their core tenets of manifest destiny. An irresistible destiny to accomplish this essential duty. An irresistible destiny to accomplish this essential duty. Let's get Habakkuk two. We gotta bring that out. And let's start at four. Actually, start at three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring something out with this in relation to us going over this picture. Man, I'm just spirit. broke down. I, I turn right to it. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Right, so obviously the ultimate full picture is the coming of Christ, our redemption, that country where God will not be ashamed of us, right? But part of the vision is being able to show who that son of perdition is. Mm -hmm. And part of that vision is one of these visuals that we just, because vision comes from visual, right? So we have this visual here, and these next verses we're going to read basically embodies this visual, okay? Come on. Read verse 4. Uh, uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Behold. His soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So it's going to let you know that his soul is not upright in him, right? Going into the atrocities that they committed unto us, going into the, 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 the robbing, the raping, their, their uh, diabolical schemes on how to continue to take our land and take our inheritance from us, like we read in Lamentations 5. Come on. Verse 5. Yea, also, because he transgresses by wine. Right. He, meaning meaning he's bringing different philosophies, different doctrines. Right. Come on. He is a proud man. Neither keep it at home. Right. So part of that, that wine you read in Micah 2 and 11 is going into him. Basically, the wine is this stuff that they have special virtues. Right. Uh, for and, and uh, for the American people and their institutions. So that goes into bringing their religion. That goes into bringing their school system to bring in the technology. Right. Basically saying this is going to be better for you if we're here. Right. So he says he digresses by wine. Come on. Who enlargeth his desire as no, hell. No, he is a proud man. Start from there. Um, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home. Right. So meaning, first of all, none of this was his. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you looking at it here and it says they they were insatiable. Right. It says that he had an irresistible. Can you go back to where we were so I could look at it real quick? It says they had an irresistible destiny to accomplish this essential duty. Right. So it says uh, he don't keep at home. He had this. It, 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 he couldn't help himself. Mm -hmm. It's like a dog that chases a car. Right. Or a cat that plays with a laser. Like you have a little laser toy. Yeah. And they just they freak the hell out. Mm -hmm. they, they can't stop themselves. <laughs> so it says he neither keep it at home. They wanted to bring the agrarian east to the west. Come on. Who enlargeth his desire as hell. He enlarged his desire as as hell now you're going to read the irresistible part come on and is as death and cannot be satisfied an irresistible destiny to accomplish this essential duty he cannot be satisfied and when it says he enlarges his desire as hell chiefly that goes into the captivity that he brought with him that goes into the uh, uh and, and everything that comes with that which is religion which is politics right it says he enlarged of his desire as hell. And guess what? That's the opposite of that heavenly rulership. Hell means they said, wait a second, Mexicans, they abolished slavery. We need to be in charge in order for this to be the way we want it to be, where we can have slaves to work this land. Mm -hmm. So what did they bring? Hell. Mm. What is hell? They brought them down into a lower state instead of a higher state. Heavenly, one of the ways you break that down is rulership. Hell is not having that rulership. Them being the head and us being the tail. So it says they cannot be satisfied, that irresistible destiny, to accomplish this essential duty. Come on. 
but gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Why? Because there were people there. They never went anywhere that was not set up where they didn't get help and guidance to help get a foothold. And then once they do that, they take it over. And they heap all these people and nations unto them. Now you're going to come and be like us. That's the manifest destiny. Let's go back to the uh, documentary. The admission of Texas and then the Mexican-American War that followed is really a war to expand slavery in America. It was a... And uh, maybe we'll get to read a little bit about it or maybe not. I'm not sure. But he says the Mexican-American War, despite whatever they tell you, was really a war to expand slavery in America. More land. Now we're going to push for more. Uh, we need more slaves so that we can reap the, the, uh, the fruits of the land this way. Come on. A short but vicious war. Once General Scott captures Mexico City and other U.S. troops occupy California, New Mexico, and the other northern territories of Mexico, the big question arises, how much of this territory is the United States going to keep? Why did they decide to go back? The possibilities of contamination, physical as well as cultural contamination, could be a real danger for the U.S. So let us move out of Mexico. Let us move out of the territory in which we can find Mexicans. We don't want a Mexico with Mexicans. Eventually. So you see, so they didn't want a Mexico with Mexicans. Mm -hmm. They just wanted the land. They said we don't want contamination. We don't want cultural influence on that stuff. Sounds exactly like they are today. That's right. That's why I say it's not was. It's is. It's not was, it is. It's still manifest today where they're at. Come on. The Congress decides to absorb as much territory as possible with the fewest people, but that leaves few hands. To so they strategically went, notice he said, now Congress got involved. Started off with just some of these slave owners and settlers, and then Congress got involved and said, you know what? We don't even really got to fight for this land because they, there's not enough of them here to defend it. Yep. They said, uh... Let's just absorb much as, as much of the land as we can. But that's power. That's gangster. To go into someone else's country and say, this is mine now, and you don't even got to fight for it. Right. Just declare a decree, and that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, the, if that's not the rule of, of, of this hell, I don't know who is. He said, what are you doing? It's my land. No, it's not. It's my land. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's my land. That's it. <laughs> Get, like did a Jedi mind trick yeah, on right. it. It's my land. Go back a little bit because you took bad long to stop it. <laughs> the mind of Eventually, Congress decides to absorb as much territory as possible with the fewest people, but that leaves few hands to mine the resources. So he said, you see, you see, that's basically where they annexed, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, listen, well, he said, let's take some of this territory that has the fewest people here. But damn. We don't even have enough slaves to work this land. Watch their craftiness. Come on. From the very beginning, the West depended for its labor on Mexicans. So that our wealth and prosperity here is not only due to the labor of the original settlers, but is also due to those Americans who were conquered. To work the land and he's letting you know that's still the case today he's going to talk about it a little more in a few and he's going to tell you the dynamic that's here and how it created like this cycle with america that's still like this to this day so this whole bs that they come in oh they're coming and they're taking jobs and all this other stuff that's just all propaganda to get you freaking simple ones on board with this stuff i was gonna say something worse but all right <laughs> <laughs> go ahead Then comes the Depression, unemployment skyrockets, a fear arises over competition by Mexican labor for jobs, and the Hoover administration initiates a massive deportation program. 
as many as a million mexicans were just loaded onto trains and shipped out of the country some estimates are that as many as 60 percent of those deported were actually american citizens there's they deported for all their see that's why we went over how we're denizens and not citizens we also did a segment on that a segment on that on this show um they were citizens of the united states at that point because because they they were using them to work the land they were the farmers basically to work this new land that they stole from them that goes into lamentations five also let's bring that out and continue reading on we finished at two Continue reading on. The book of Lamentations, chapter 5 and verse 2. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. Come on. So first they took the land, right? Come on. We are orphans and fatherless. Our mothers as are as widows. Right, because it created a dynamic where they weren't really able to be with their family here. So it says they were orphans and fatherless. They were as widows. There were certainly atrocities being committed against them. This is That's a separate segment that we'll go over the show. You have Mexican lynchings. They were U.S. citizens that were being lynched. We did a show on that as well. Um, and I think Aparium did something about it recently again. Mm -hmm. um, the gas baths at the border. All right. They were doing this to so-called U.S. citizens. So they created this dynamic where uh, they would they the children became orphans. Right. The fathers were taken away. Their mothers were as widows. Yeah, because, like, you know, that they weren't doing their due diligence and saying, OK, who's your dad? Who's your mom? Let's take you all together. Yeah. No, they were, they were just rounding them up, throwing them on trains and yeah. then shipping them off. That's it. And shipping them off. Right. Come on. We have drunk in our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. Man, that takes another. I, I, Lamentations five is one is one of my favorites historically, mm -hmm. and it applies for every captivity for for uh, Northern Kingdom especially, especially. And one of the ones. This is a new understanding with this new history that we're getting out from Mexico. And when it says we have drunk in our water for money and our wood is sold unto us, America took their land, and then made them work that land for Americans. So it was their resources. It was their land. A lot of these people, it was their farms. Mm -hmm. And they took it and sold it onto them. And they took it and sold it onto them. Right? Come on. Uh, play, the, play the video. It's been a pattern now for the last hundred years of Mexicans being recruited into the country and then shipped back out of the country. Recruited into the country, shipped back out of the country. The reality is that it's two countries, but one economy. The Mexicans function. And set it up to go back just like five seconds. He said the reality is it's two countries, but one economy. One depends on the other. So for all this crap that they talk about Mexicans taking jobs and stealing this and destroying the economy, they could not exist without the Mexican labor that comes in. Nope. And he That's says right. it's a vicious cycle of when times were good in America, they actually had incentives to recruit them to come in. And the ones that were crossed illegally, that means they probably tell them, well, let some of them come through. We need more farm workers. Things are good. Yep. Come on. You know your typical Edomite is not trying to be a farmer. Right. No. He's not trying to go, and I don't mean a farmer that he owns the farm. <laughs> He's not trying to go and pick and work in the fields. That's hard, laborious work. He's going to be like... Oh, you know what? I just got a kink in my neck. I'm going to take the rest of the day off. Otherwise, I am no good for work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Come on, bro. Right. Hey, Ke Stop. In the South, they actually, there's a, doc there's a lot of documentaries on YouTube, but in the South, there's a lot of farm and a lot of warehouse jobs, and they bring Mexicans in, and then that certain season is done, and then, all right, we're going to call ice now. Yep. It's time to call ice. Yep. Wow. So he just gave you some insight into like a modern practice that they do. That's crazy. So it basically it's still going on today. So they'll lure them in, they'll recruit them in, they'll work things out. Hey, you know another way they do it? Even legally, they'll they'll do a work visa and then when they don't need you no more, they they cancel your work visa. Yep. Mm -hmm. Send them back. And then crazy. what happens without that? You gotta go back. That's evil as hell. So it, it again going into that lamentations. Go ahead, let's read on, let's read verse five. Verse five. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. Right, because farming job is sun up to sundown, right? 
And guess what? When they come back, it's not like they come. It's not like they come back to Mexico and they and they're all on vacation. They working. They moving. But they they have this vicious cycle of being uh, in servitude to them. It's slavery without the chains, mm-hmm. because of the ties with the economy. They have to. They depend on the money that comes from America. That's why it's uh, there's there's so much poverty in a lot of Mexico. So they depend on that. It's a vicious cycle. They labor and have no rest. Come on, read. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians and to be satisfied with bread. Because they have no choice, right? Sometimes I bring this out and I say they did it willingly out of being foolish, trying to be like uh, to get in in good with Edom. That's how it eventually started with them. They invited them in, but they invited them in with the hopes of, hey, they'll help us maintain this land, which is ours. And then these guys just came in and said, nah, this ain't yours no more. We're the government here. We're what says. And now they wound up in this position, right, where they're just there because they gave the hand to these to these uh, uh, devils that now they, they go through all these things that we're reading here. Go ahead, play. The reality is that it's two countries but one economy. The Mexicans function as a reserve labor force in good times in America and as an expendable labor force in the bad times. America, they're a reserve labor force. They augment their labor force with us. I don't want them to tell you all that BS and that propaganda you hear. And he says when it's bad time, they're a dispen- expendable labor force, meaning they're going to send them home. Come on. Yesterday... December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. During World War II, you couldn't get any more immigrants from Europe. And the United States economy to fight the war was growing. The government was forced with two choices. Bring African Americans up from the South and bring Mexicans and Puerto Ricans up from Latin America. So this is World War II, right? So you're talking about, you know, the 1940s here. So at this point, right, slavery in its traditional construct was abolished. But you still had uh, segregation. You still had, uh, and it was both. We show the signs where it says no Negroes, no Mexicans. Why do you think those signs were in the same place if we were not oppressed together? Yeah, right. right. The Bible tells you Judah and Israel were oppressed together. Together, and it says they cannot. They refuse to let them go because they continue to utilize us. They continue to use us to continue to uh, maintain their prosperity. You see, nobody ever asked yourself that question. Damn, you got these signs that say no Negroes, no Mexicans. I thought we weren't together. I thought we didn't suffer the same things. Yeah, right, right. right. The reason it said no Negroes, no Mexicans is because under segregation, now without chains, they had both of them working the fields. So when we were uh, more, I don't want to say primitive, when we were more uh, traditionally indigenous, we were working with the so-called uh, black slaves. And then now when there were no more chains and we were both under uh, Jim Crow and stuff like that, right? The appearance of having some freedom and liberty, they had us working together in that capacity. But now it was the money that they leveraged over us. All right. So go ahead. In Spanish, Traceros means a man who works with arms and hands. That was that. And let me tell you something. That's Deuteronomy 2837. That's mm-hmm. a proverb and a byword. They didn't call them the Mexican farmers or whatever it was. And even Mexican is a, a, a byword. They called them braceros. Braceros. That's a, that's not a nice term. That's a derogatory term. Because you know what that does? That dehumanizes the the workers Mm -hmm. because now you're not seeing them as people you call them braceros you have this name right that means arms that means that's all they saw them for arms and you see them working in the field with their arms come on in spanish braceros means a man who works with arms and hands but in american lingo they are called lifesavers during world war ii the bracero program said they were lifesavers they needed them. Can we can we get that scripture that says Judah and Israel pressed together? Because that's the same one where it says he refused to let them go, right? Yep. Yeah, get that real quick. 
the he called them life savers. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 33. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah. That's were, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Come on. Were oppressed together. Not only did we work in the fields together under captivity with yokes of iron, we also did so under the segregation era when there was no civil rights. Come on. And all that took them captives held them fast. They refused to let them go. They refused to let them go because we were their lifeblood. They said braceros in American lingo means lifesavers. Hey, that's like in the Matrix where the people were batteries to power the, the system. Right. That's how they look at that's how they look at us. We're arms and legs, we're the lifesavers to be able to keep them sustained. Come on. As a means of guaranteeing the steady flow of labor. The important thing at those days was how many hands do you have? Quantas manos tiene? The more hands you had, the more cotton you could pick. What he's saying is letting you know it's all about the number of laborers. That's what was important in that day. How many hands do you have? Dang, man. He went to World War II and Korea, bro. Yep. Dang. Yeah. Go ahead. So education for Latinos was not that important. At age 10, I began my first formal schooling, a school that was called Schumannsville Mexican School. So remember how the Manifest Destiny brought the school book with them? They said, we're going to use the education system to condition these people. It was called Schumannsville Mexican School. It was a Mexican school. Come on. We had one room, one teacher, eight grades. I felt that the some people mad when when you have thirty students in with one teacher in a classroom. Uh, he said there was one room, all eight grades with one teacher, which goes to show you they were not really invested in a real education for them. It was just enough so that they can fill the position in society that they wanted them to fulfill. That's hell. Mm -hmm. That's a proud man that transgressive by wine. That's one of the most hypocritical things you could do. Yeah, we're gonna train them, but we're gonna train them to be. The, the braceros, the arms and legs and feet of our economy, not to be in the upper echelon, the authoritative positions that we're in. Go ahead. Eight grades. I felt that the majority of society wanted to keep you down, that you were a migrant. You should be in your mind right there. No dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. In their mind, they were all the same. But it goes to show you that we were oppressed together. We were the same. Remember, he just said earlier, they brought, uh, they called them African slaves, but they brought Southern Kingdom slaves, right? And then they had the Mexican farm workers. Uh, I'm sorry, they weren't slaves at this point. They brought uh, the, the farmers, the sharecroppers and stuff, right? And they brought them with the Mexicans and they served together. So what happened is in those communities, they didn't want them in certain restaurants and stuff like that. You could work our field. You're our life's blood. But you better not come in here. We ain't serving you nothing. Go ahead. Place. Two days after my 17th birthday, I was sent to the South Pacific. You could fast forward here a little bit. So he got enlisted into, and so what Captain Murray was saying, damn, he's serving World War II and the Korean War. Uh, America suffered so many deaths in that, and this this dude is still alive uh, through all that. Because he gets a little patriotic here, so he fell asleep too. Even though he's telling you all this history, he's telling you how proud he is that he served this country and all this Bro, other stuff like that. He said he said two days after my 17th birthday. Yeah, they got they called him young, bro. Remember, used to, it's 18 now. They said two days after 17th birthday, they 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 drafted him in. And then sent them to the South Pacific. Bro, that's insane. Yeah. Oh, my wife texted me the, the right uh thing. Yes, hun. I know I know that's the Spanish way to sell it, but that's the way Iso was saying it. Braceros, right? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and they had their own definition of it. Uh, I get it. It means many arms. You're sticking up for your slang language. <laughs> okay, sis. <laughs> she texted me the right spelling. You know hey, you know how they get. They Bro, get I know. The Bruh. Spanish gotta be perfect. <laughs> That, thank, thank you, hun. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate you. Th thank you for your support. That means you're watching 
and listening. It's not just on in the background. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, you don't go that far forward. Go over. Go back. Go back. Go back. Stop. Stop there. Let me see what he's saying there. And I got a job teaching one of the poor school districts in Texas. And I had 44 students, all Latinos. I still run into so many students, and some would say to me, it had not been for you, I would have never finished high school. whatever they're trying to make a feel good story uh, oh, out of it stop yeah. you can't make documentaries like this with this much truth of without course, throwing yeah, in of some course. of this stuff see but at the end of the day america was good for him get out of here with that nonsense but well oh so what the, and he survived all that he actually tells a story about how like he saved a lot of people's lives and stuff over there but then he starts talking about how he's so proud he always wears this medal and his american flag so that's why i said i didn't we, that part's not necessary but go ahead always wear in my lapel an American flag because I am so proud to have served this country and my parents Bruh. are very proud that I served this country we got my, my thing after like warrior week and like the air force and stuff like that so it was like you know I was like they, they played I'm proud to be an American I know, and then that was after Bruh. proud to be. That was after, and I was like, <laughs> that was after, that was after Warrior Week in the Air Force. Imagine how proud he was after World War Two in Korea. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. So, so you get it, right? This yeah, dude saw course. combat, yeah, save people's lives, or whatever. So he's just like, you know, all into it. But right, exactly. Just after, like, you know, the week before last in basic, I was yeah, crying yeah. like all proud. You know, the freaking colonel came over. This is why I did it. This you get, did. Yeah, you give the colonel. It was all worth it. You give the colonel the salute and the handshake, and, and and he calls you airman, and you're yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> freak out of here with that stuff. <laughs> hey, you, you marines know. You marines know. This is why we wake up. <laughs> this is what we do it for. <laughs> Go ahead. Hundred thousand Mexicans and Puerto Ricans served in World War Two, and. Ass. <laughs> more. Like five more seconds. There we go. Several hundred thousand Mexicans and Puerto Ricans served in World War Two. The, several hundred thousand Mexicans and Puerto Ricans served in World War Two. And then these dudes is calling my brother a pinche Mexicano. Bro. The hell bro that thing this? had me mad, bro. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> and interestingly, much of the civil rights ferment in the Latino community came after the war from those veterans. What he's talking about is that uh, there was a lot of activism after that, right? And this, um, we're not going to talk about it today, but, you know, Cesar Chavez, uh, if, you're from, if you're here in Arizona and in, like, the Southwest, is a very... Um, uh, popular name they'll name schools and streets and parks and things after him yep. uh, but a lot of people don't understand the history behind that he was actually one of the main proponents of the farmers and their dispute um, when we spoke with um, uh, Dr. Sanchez he he mentioned that there was you know some overlap but he he almost tried to say like yeah but you know they were having like a farming dispute but that was all as you understand now or you should after watching these clips and stuff it, it was all interconnected that what led to what he's talking about now. So this is what we saw, what we're watching in these clips, and it's almost done, is a uh, condensed uh, version of various topics that we've spoken about at the show, <laughs> including with what we dealt with with Dr. Sanchez and the Brown Berets, because a lot of those people that were in that movement <coughs> rallied to that. Same thing with the Young Lords, because a lot of them were veterans that had served and felt disenfranchised and they saw this type of thing like, damn, you know, I just did all this from the, for this country. Yeah. I fought in all these different wars and this is the type of stuff that you, you're coming with. But talk about a patriotic person calling me now. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead, play this. Dr. King convened us. We can talk about the, what the farm workers meant and how they fed the country. Because we who in the South grew up picking cotton and chopping tobacco, didn't know those who were picking tomatoes and picking lettuce and picking grapes. We didn't know. We were Stop. 
He said he's admitting, and let me tell you something for, for my Southern Kingdom brothers and sisters, especially the ones that have not embraced that we're all one people yet. Mm. All right. He's telling you that we're all under the same curses. He's, he's not about this Bible, but he's telling you we're all under the same curses. He said, while we were picking cotton and tobacco, they were picking tomatoes and other stuff on the other side. Mm -hmm. We were in the South. They were in the Southwest and the West doing the same thing. Right. He says it, but we didn't know it. We didn't know it until much later when we started these different movements and we came together in some similarities. Right. This is what he's going into right now. Come on. Because we who in the South grew up picking cotton and chopping tobacco, didn't know those who were picking tomatoes and picking lettuce and picking grapes. We didn't know we were being picked on in different fields. So you saw that? And he says not just the, through the labors, we didn't know that we were both being picked on in different fields, right? Because at this point now, there was some separation there, right? So he's saying that he's telling you when he said, when the we here that he's talking about is Southern Kingdom. Mm -hmm. He's saying the so-called American black did not unknow this. So he, he, you know, like I said, he's a little bit of a sellout now in these last days. It's all about politics and stuff like that. It, it's not to say there's not. We have um, people who were brown berets, and they're all about their career now and stuff like that, and uh, also young lords, right? right? Go ahead. And different languages. When we were fighting for voting rights, that we sit in the same office together. We were fighting for equal protection, that we sit. We fight for affirmative action, that we sit. We fight for he's letting you know he's saying that it's the same thing. We were both fighting for voting rights. We were both fighting for affirmative action. We were both fighting for, for, for equal rights. But Esau chose to highlight one over the other because they did not want us galvanized together. Mm -hmm. You saw that if you watched the, uh, the movie with Fred Hampton uh, that, that came out. Uh, Hoover was upset because he saw him. You see a little clip where they show the young lords with him. And it was right after then that he said, we got to take Fred Hampton down. Yep. He said, no, 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 this guy's uniting these two people. They throw in the the the, the Edomite farmers and stuff there. That, that I forgot what they, what were they called in the thing? I forgot what the hell they were called. The Rainbow Coalition or whatever. Something like that, yeah. I don't know. No, I, no, uh, I, Patriots. The Patriots or whatever it was, right? The Rainbow Coalition was all of them together. Um, so, uh, but what Hoover, Hoover didn't say he's mad about the Edomites being with them. Hoover was mad that the, the Latinos we're, we're coming together with uh, the so-called blacks. That's right! Uh, uh, Fred Hampton, Illinois Black Panther Party. He's <laughs> <laughs> a good actor, that dude. Go ahead. She have board seats that we sit. So on all issues around equal opportunity and equal protection under the law and civil rights and social justice, that we end up together. So stop. So he said under all issues for equal rights, for equal justice, he said we end up together. I can't believe that he actually even came out and said this stuff on here, bro, to be honest. <sighs> it's the most high. Sometimes yeah. the most high just pops somebody to say something. Lord will the, the most high puts on his spirit to admit that he got Martin Luther King Jr. killed too. Yeah. Like on his deathbed. That's I right. understand that dude, but that was good though. Was yeah, good. so I thought that was so profound because there's so much on both sides, mm -hmm. right? I mean, let's let's get that in uh, Isaiah, is Isaiah about uh, Judah will not vex Ephraim, and Ephraim will not envy Judah. Where's that? Uh, Isaiah 11. 11. 11. Fra <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Uh, 13. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11 and verse 13. Freedom! The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. Right. Hey, and you know, I like to harp on this a lot because uh, Got to, Judah, you Judah, to. Judah always mistakenly says yeah. Ephraim vexing Judah. That's not what the <laughs> Bible says. The Bible says Judah was vexing Ephraim. What it said was Ephraim was envious. And that stems from a lot of things. But in the context of what we're talking about here, some of that envy was while we were fighting for the same things, who got more attention? Right. Who, who, who actually were they listening to for? Us not knowing that that was the tense of Judah being raised first, right? Yeah, right. It started with that revolutionary spirit that had to be inspired, right? And then as a product of that, because a lot of those uh, uh, elders that first started teaching 
uh, the true understanding of the Bible in this modern era, um, a lot of them came from these type of movements. Mm -hmm. And that's what gave them that motivation to be able to like kind of like a boot camp of sorts, like a training to say, mm -hmm. hey, uh, we got to go and do it. They're, they're, that, the prophecy where it says their hands was in the neck of their enemy. Um, so while we didn't realize at that time that that was prophecy being fulfilled, that's why it happened. But in a modern take on this verse, that's kind of where that envy came from. It's like, damn, we're not being heard. We're not getting the rights that we need. Mm -hmm. We're still being treated like crap and relegated as second-class citizens, and they're getting all this type of attention, right? Spiritually, obviously, that goes to from, you know, if you're just dealing straight with the Bible, like, you know, Christ coming from there and the scepter not departing from Judah. Again, not understanding what that really meant, right? That's an ignorance. But in relation to what we're speaking about, that's where some of that envy comes from. Come on. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Right, so I, I hear Judah a lot talking about, oh, man, that's just Northern Kingdom vexing. Northern Kingdom, that, that's, not, that's not it. Seconds. That's not it. It's the other way <laughs> around. So it's on both sides that you have this division stuff at times, right? As, as, um, as a nation, as 12 tribes, right? Um but that stuff has to be put away. So I like what, what Jesse was saying here because he's letting you know that none of that stuff matters. That that shows that you're not kingdom-minded if yep. you're worrying about vexation and envy, right? right. And and even more when you're trying to assign that vexation and envy in uh, uh, other places. Yeah, and right. I say this by and large. The men really don't deal with that a lot. Bring it out. The men really don't deal with that a lot. But you, sister, man, I was listening to a Titus 2 one time. They're talking about colorism. And, but, and it just sounded like it was like, yeah, it's because y'all like that. It's because y'all, meaning it's because Northern Kingdom is like this. That's why we're like that. Mm. The hell is this? And I'm like, man, there's some of stuff. But, you know, he's like, how much I said, <laughs> I said, I'm not getting involved in women's stuff. I'm on my way out to do a class or to prepare this or whatever yeah, it is. Right. You know, and I had heard some stuff on it. Uh, the men really don't have that issue that much. That's why it gets me even more mad when I see a brother talk crap about, you know, see-through Hebrews or whatever the hell they saying no. and all that other stuff. Because right? the men should know and understand better, you know? Ten seconds. But it, listen, it, it, if Jesse and all his coonery can acknowledge yeah, that right. in our afflictions we right. are the same, then that's the beginning of you understanding the foundation of our repentance, which is to take those curses, which were to be a sign and a wonder for us. Let's read that real quick. Deuteronomy 28. Start at 45. But what you brought up was a heavy two cap because what they took and meant for it to be evil toward us by hearing out the so-called blacks and kind of sweeping them under the, the uh, Hispanics under the rug. Right. The most I used that and turned it, like you said, is the, is the tense of Judah being raised first. And. There's nothing that you can do. All things work together for good, whether yeah. it be good or bad. Can do nothing and, and against the truth but for right. it. And that's mm -hmm. just prophecy being lined up because the most I still had it documented so we could still go back and see the curses still fit the people. So it's still beneficial. It just was it with the most high's time. Right, right. Exactly. All praises, all praises. Read this real quick. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 45. In relation to what Jesse was saying, in other words, this is how the Bible said it, right? And he was saying, in all these things, we're the same. In all these afflictions, we're the same. Come on, read. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed. Right, so it says all these curses, and... and in reality, that's what we're going over when we go over these history. We're showing through various times in history. You want to talk about, you watch a, a, a movie that has time travel and, you know, oh, Endgame, they went here and they went there to get this stone and that stone. Mm -hmm. Hey, in the spirit, that's what we're doing. We go to the conquistadors. We go to the time of our forefathers. We go to modern times. We go to 100 years ago, 50 years ago. And we and we snatch little pieces of history and piece it together and show you in the Bible that it's showing who they are. So the Bible calls those the curses. So we highlight those curses. Right. And it says they'll be upon us. Come on. Because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God. For our rebellious spirit. Read. To keep his commandments and his statutes which I commit which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for and us. And they. And they and these curses, this history, as we go and we go through time, 
spiritually in bringing out this stuff historically. As we go through history and we see these curses, he says, these things shall be upon you, Israelites, southern and northern kingdom, all tribes. Come on. For a sign and for a wonder. For a sign and for a wonder. Because that's why what Jesse said at the end of that thing was so profound as we read this out. We the same. In the afflictions, we the same. You were picking cotton and tobacco. We were picking lettuce and tomatoes and grapes. We were doing this. Hey, and then really, we were picking cotton too. When you go back to a different history of time, Gad was in there with the with the natives doing that same stuff. They were just uh, in this too. Uh, Puerto Ricans and Central South America, we were doing tobacco also. Yep. Sugar, pineapples, bananas, all those different things. Right? So it says they will be upon thee for a sign and come on. And upon thy seed forever. Uh, for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. This is why we pluck all this from different periods of time, from different periods of time to bring this understanding out. So, listen, stuff like this, if you're already believing, establishes your faith more. And if you don't, it'll spread the word to those who are out there also. This is why we're always telling you, like, share, support, get the subscriptions up. Not because we want any type of accolades, but those are the type of metrics that will drive more eyes to the page. And they'll get to see this type of stuff and this type of information. And Lord's will, the we plant, we water, and the Most High will give that increase. I got a lot more stuff. Go ahead. You got some closing comments? Nope, no, that's it, man. I got this. And there's a lot from the... We're going to have to do Mexico part two. We're going to we're gonna do this topic next part two next week. Yeah. Lord's will. All right? Yeah. There's this, this too much on Mexico. Hey, they, they, they the largest another kingdom tribe in the States by, right. by number. So we got we to gotta do it. We got to do it again. We got to do it again. Anyway, that's the show for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Continue to support. Don't forget to support the Booster Club, IUIC, that fundraising at IsraelUnite.org. Uh, we're going to keep hitting these travels to these Northern Kingdom countries, right? Um, we're looking to get more travel even um, for uh, the Southern Kingdom countries again. Just there's still a lot of restrictions in some of these places. But as we're able, we're going to continue to do it. Lord's will we continue to come out of this. Uh, yeah, watch. You're going to see towards the end of this year, going into next year, I guarantee you're going to see that travel step up. The line will go out into all the earth, all right? right? All right. So the truth got to be preached unto every nation and then shall the truth and then shall the end come, right? So repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. With that, right. we say shalom. Shalom. Let go. Israel is back. We back. Israel is back. We got back. the nations running scared because Israel is back. All lies on us because we keeping them low. When the Lord will return, Babylon will fall. Precept solid. We got them on lock. God's chosen people with Christ as our rock. Israel is back. We back. Israel is back. We back. You heathen geek, you ready for our whip to.